Hello and welcome to The Rob Burgess Show. I am, of course, your host, Rob Burgess. On this, our 156th episode, our returning guest is Jonathan Fowler. You first heard Jonathan Fowler on episodes 2, 10, 20, 21, 29, 30, 31, 32, 34, 35, 43, 48, 51, 56, 64, 74, 83, 92, 102, 103, 104, 105, 106, 107, 108, 109, 111, 114, 115, 116, 119, 126, 127, 133, 137, 140, 146, 147, 149, 153, and episode 82, which also featured fellow regular guest Ash Burgess of the podcast. Jonathan graduated with a BA in history from Indiana University in 2006. He's an unabashed left-wing political junkie. He has lived and worked in South Korea for over 10 years, trying to help the citizens of that great nation hopefully talk pretty one day. And now on to the show. I was just watching the debate just now. I kind of started at the beginning and stuff, even though there were one or two sections where I like went to the bathroom or something when I was watching the original one or whatever. So, mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> yeah, I was watching it in a public forum, so I couldn't, you know, just pause it or whatever. I ordered some food at one point or something, mm-hmm. but uh, it was a yeah, it was a fun forum to watch it that way. Yeah. Who did the people you watched it with like? <clears throat> well, um, I didn't get a chance to uh, talk to everybody, but. You know, there seemed to be a consensus that uh, well, some people, several people seem to like Bernie. Um, one woman who said she was, uh, well, actually, let me like, I mean, I should kind of like uh, preface, you know, where I was, who I was with, what I was doing and stuff. So uh, it was the Korean Thanksgiving holiday called Chuseok, basically. And I was, it was Chuseok Day and I had kind of been... Uh, I don't know, what can we say? I would, I'd kind of been out all day and stuff. I would, had been trying to find food because most restaurants are closed on that day and I don't have like a Korean family to cook for me or whatever. So, um, you know, it, it's like, you know, Christmas or Thanksgiving. Most people are with their families and they have a huge feast that their wives or mothers have prepared and stuff. So, um, mm-hmm. I, yeah. So I went to Seoul to try to eat some food at a very good uh, Thai restaurant called Wong Thai in Itaewon. If you're ever in Korea, people, you should check it out. It's some of the best mm. Thai food I've ever had. And I've never been to Thailand, so I can't, I don't know, <laughs> but it's, it's very good. So, uh, just believe that. Um, and, but unfortunately I got, I got to one about seven o'clock and they were closed. I was there at six thirty maybe. And so, so then I, after that, I started walking to the area where the, uh, the Democrats abroad were holding a debate watch party on YouTube or whatever at a local bar. <laughs> So I went mm-hmm. there and stuff, and um, first I couldn't find the bar. It was over in near, well, Noksapyong Station for people who may have been in Korea and stuff. So um, <clears throat> I don't know what can I say. It was uh, it was it, it was interesting. There weren't too many people there at first. I think you know, I don't know, <laughs> going to a political thing on a on the biggest one of the two biggest holidays in Korea of the year <laughs> when some people may have families or whatever. You know, people are out partying or they're on vacation themselves. It's It just wasn't maybe a huge priority for everybody. But there were seven or eight or ten people there, I guess, and stuff. So um, so I went there and met the guy who was kind of organizing it. He seemed pretty cool and everything. He was uh, from North Carolina, uh, so we talked about that a little bit and stuff. He was from Charlotte area, I think. And, yeah, then we... I ordered a drink or two, ordered some pub food, which was not great, um, mm-hmm. and uh, got started. Oh, by the way, Bob, I recently picked up a uh, microphone, a headset. Let me let me use this and see if this uh, – my mom and dad have both said that this vastly improves the quality of uh, audio recording. So let me – Okay. I mean, I can hear you just fine now, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Hang on, let me. It's it's turned on. Let me switch on my Wi-Fi. Uh, All right, can you hear me now? Uh, that's actually much worse. <laughs> really? Okay. Can you? How's this? 
It's terrible. Can you, t- can you can you go back to the way you prefer before? <laughs> huh. Yeah, that from sounds like I've better. heard it. I don't know. Yeah, from people I've heard it, it works pretty well. But because uh, huh. some people have had a lot of trouble, like talk, hearing my voice or something from Korea or whatever. It's like, I don't know. Mom's complained about it incessantly, and she said this thing makes the audio quality much better. <laughs> I don't know. So. Yeah, it, on my end, it, it sounded like you were on a speakerphone, like far away somehow, all of a sudden. So. Hmm. All right, I guess I'll keep keeping this thing in the crook of my neck then. <laughs> <laughs> Are you saying you're going to send any future chiropractic bills to care of the Rob Burgess show? <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, unless uh, universal basic, you know, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. I, I don't know. I can't even complete it. Sorry, I had an exhausting day today. I uh, I don't know. I uh, worked, went home. Mm-hmm. Uh, went back to work like two hours later after the first three hours at a company, came back home. One hour later, went back to teach a one-on-one, went back home. Then two hours later, I went back to teach another one in a one-on-one, finally came back home. It was, you know, at that point, I've been working for basically 12 hours straight. Well, not working directly, but, you know, working for three hours, taking a break, working for one hour, taking a break, one, mm-hmm. working for one hour, you know, all the way from 6.30 a.m. until 6, like 30 p.m., basically. Oh, and then I went to the gym. So um, anyway, sorry, I'm kind of off to a rambling start here. <laughs> um, I don't know. They did not everybody, you know mentioned who they were supporting necessarily uh i don't know there were you know as, as is their right you know everybody always makes a big deal in america you don't have to tell people who you're voting for it's like okay but you know you can <laughs> 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 i mean nobody nobody used that excuse but like i don't know at one point they kind of asked where, where everybody was leaning and you know i said bernie one or two other people said bernie there was one woman who was there and she said like well i'm going back to america before uh before the next year or something and so when i get back to america i'll decide or something but she's like i i don't know i think like bernie i think you know i'm from a rural state and stuff and like i think she was from somewhere in the northeast and Hmm. she's like i don't think people realize that like you know the bernie sanders socialism stuff just doesn't fly with a lot of former trump voters and it's like i don't know um you know there's a couple of arguments to be made, you know, whether it's base activation or, you know, seducing Trump voters back to the sanity. Mm-hmm. So I don't I think she was addressing one of those. I don't think she was really acknowledging that, you know, these people may be gone. And that's, you know, it may just be a matter of getting reasonable people to show up more. Yeah. So um, but she mentioned something about it, Amy Klobuchar. Which is like, oh boy. Get out of the race, Amy not... Klobuchar. Get out of the race. <laughs> <laughs> Done with you. Yeah. <laughs> did, did you see Bill Maher the other day say that Amy Klobuchar could be like a compromise candidate? Can I present a scenario? I think this might be one of those years where it's the, as the discussion Mike and I were having. It's that they can't get over that centrist versus socialist thing. So... Elizabeth Warren at some point takes Bernie's voters. He drops out. It's Warren and Biden. And they go to the convention, and it's deadlocked. This has happened before in American politics, and they need a compromise candidate. I'm looking hard at Amy Klobuchar. You know why? Because, like, this is not an insult to Amy Klobuchar. I like you. But when they put generic Democrat on the ballot... They win. So you don't have a fa- uh, but Bill, She's a but woman, Bill, so like that you know helps. That wins? moves a lot well, with the a West, a wokesters, and then she's Why a. Why do you think that economic populism, whatever you want to call it, socialism, democratic socialism, et cetera, Medicare for all, is so unpopular? When a poll just came out that had Bernie Sanders beating Trump in Texas by more than any of the other candidates, the last twenty polls have shown Bernie Sanders beating Trump. And here's the other thing, though. Meaning. Meaning. 
that you don't need a centrist to win. Centrism is why we have lost. It's why we lost well, a thousand first state of, house seats. Know. It's why we lost the White House. We ran a centrist. But, but, but we lost. But, but even the centrists in the Democratic Party are pretty far left. They're right. not. They're they're center, Bill, you got the right. They're center left in the, the right whole people. country, not just the liberal bubble. You got the right C word, but it isn't centrism. It's charisma. Who is the Democratic candidate that is going to inspire America, build a movement? Those are the Democratic candidates that we're fucked. There's nobody like that. Who supports these candidates? Who has the multiracial working class coalition that you could build from to inspire people to actually show up on election day? That is still Bernie Sanders. So I don't know why you okay, so it, ain't so it ain't enough. It so ain't. It's like a compromise between what? <laughs> Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden supporters? <laughs> We're gonna meet you uh, halfway. Yeah. It'll be a woman. Exactly. How inspiring to stand for like nothing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Amy, 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 I eat my salad with my, with my, uh, you know, I know we harp on that, but damn. Didn't, and didn't she like, didn't she make one of her staff members call some people she was supposed to be at a meeting with and tell them like, I'm sorry, my boss is not at the meeting right now. It's my fault because I'm an idiot. <laughs> and she's like, she made her say that to these people that she was going to be late for the meeting for or something. Wow. Wow. This is not a nice person, you no. know. Uh, so yeah, I, don't, I don't know who she's supposed to be appealing to, but she we'll get to uh, her incredibly. I don't even know what she was thinking, quote, about this, this is the creation story later. but um, The creation story. Yeah. Uh, well, you I'm, know how I'm... they ask uh, what your first day in office, what you would do, what's the first thing you'd do. And she went down the list. She was like, the first day, I'll do this. And on the second day, I'll do this. And then she started, I'm like, is she, is she paraphrasing the book of Genesis? And she was. And then she hmm. gets to the seventh day and she's like, I, don't, I know you're supposed to rest on the seventh day. But I'm not going to. So it's no. like, okay, first you're comparing yourself to God, but now you're better than God because God's a loser who takes breaks, and I won't take breaks because I may be Klobuchar. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know who these people are talking to. Trying to talk to. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not feeling it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it's I have to admit, it's been a little while since I watched the debate. So it's not the whole thing is not fresh in my mind, but I did just watch about 30 to 35 minutes of it. So I got most of the way through the healthcare part and got into some of the other stuff, I think, about uh, racism or something briefly. But again, but um, yeah, I've got I've got my my trusty notes. So that's, <laughs> there's always that. Yeah. So um, so I tried to order some food at this bar. And they were like, um, OK, we have all the options here, except no, none of the vegetarian options, none of the vegan options. And I said, you're you know, this bar is hosting the Democratic <laughs> debate watch party and you don't have vegetarian options. <laughs> not that not that I'm a vegetarian, but I hate hamburgers. And that was like that was 75 percent of their menu. Oh, man. <laughs> I ended up getting some French fries, which were okay. But, you know, after a full day of not eating anything until 7 p.m., I'm like, I want a meal. You know, I want some food. I want some meat and vegetables, and I don't want a hamburger. <laughs> so eventually later I ended up ordering this uh, lamb kind of pastry, lamb pie thing. I don't know what it was. But, um, yeah, this is at the Hidden Cellar Bar in Nooksapyeong for people in Korea. We're giving a shout out to the disappointing service. <laughs> well, the food was okay. It was all right. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, you know, I wanted something a little bit more substantial, but everything was closed that day. Mm. So, um, yeah, so we had the debate. Um, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm just totally wiped out today. Yesterday was like a 16 hour ordeal, and then today was just. On again, off again, on again, off again, all day long. Um, okay, so we had the ABC Democratic debate in Houston, Texas. Hosts were George Stephanopoulos, Jorge Ramos, Lindsay Somebody, and David Somebody. I honestly didn't catch their names. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we always uh, like to be authoritative here, Chas, so I appreciate your attention to detail. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I acknowledge them. <laughs> 
if <laughs> hey, if they're famous enough, you should know them by their first names only anyway. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Um, opening statements, I don't know. All candidates have been told they can have one minute to make an opening statement, and we're going to begin in reverse polling order with Secretary Julian Castro. Good evening. Y bienvenidos a Texas. Welcome to Texas. It's great to be here at TSU, home of the Tigers. You know, on January 20th, 2021, at 12.01 p.m., we're going to have a Democratic president, a Democratic House, and a Democratic Senate. There will be life after Donald Trump. But the truth is that our problems didn't start just with Donald Trump. And we won't solve them by embracing old ideas. We need a bold vision. Universal pre-K and universal health care. Unleashing millions of new jobs in the clean energy economy. A tax system that rewards people who have to work for a living. But first we have to win. And that means exciting a young, diverse coalition of Americans who are ready for a bold future. That's what Kennedy did. It's what Carter did. It's what Clinton did. It's what Barack Obama did. And it's what I can do in this race. Get back Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, Florida, Georgia, and Arizona. And finally, turn Texas blue and say goodbye to Donald Trump. Senator Klobuchar. Good evening, Texas Southern. I believe that what unites us up here, the 10 of us, is much stronger than what divides us. And I think that's true of our country, too. Now, I may not be the loudest person up here, but I think we've already got that in the White House. <laughs> Houston, we have a problem. This, we have a guy there that is literally running our country like a game show. He would rather lie than lead. I think we need something different. I am someone that tells the truth. I don't make promises that I can't keep. I have people's back, and I believe that to win, you bring people with you, and that is how you govern as well. So you're going to hear a lot of ideas up here. Some will be great, but if you see that some of them seem a little off track, I've got a better way. If you feel stuck in the middle of the extremes in our politics and you are tired of the noise and the nonsense, you've got a home with me. Because I don't want to be the president for half of America. I want to be the president for all of America. <clears throat> Congressman Better O'Rourke. It's an honor to be on this debate stage. It is wonderful to be back in Texas, in Houston, back here at TSU. On August 3rd, in El Paso, Texas, two things became crystal clear for me and I think produced a turning point for this country. The first is just how dangerous Donald Trump is, the cost and the consequence of his presidency. A racism and violence that had long been a part of America was welcomed out into the open and directed to my hometown of El Paso, Texas, where 22 people were killed, dozens more grievously injured by a man carrying a weapon he should never have been able to buy in the first place, inspired to kill by our president. The second is how insufficient our politics is to meet the threat that we have right now. The bitterness, the pettiness, the smallness of the moment, the incentives to attack one another and try to make differences without distinctions, mountains out of molehills. We have to be bigger. We have to see clearly. We have to speak honestly, and we have to act decisively. That's what I want to do for you as President of the United States. Thank you. Senator Cory Booker. It was over 20 years ago that I was a law student and moved to inner city Newark, New Jersey, uh, to serve as a tenants' rights lawyer to try to address the challenges in my community. And I was sobered by them, the gun violence, uh, the substandard housing. But it was my greatest mentor, a woman named Miss Virginia Jones, who challenged me. She said, boy, if all you see in this neighborhood is problems, that's all there's ever going to be. But if you're stubborn and defiant and going to put forth a vision that can unify people, then we can make transformative change. She was a church woman that said, without vision, the people will perish. 
Well, that's exactly what we did. We created extraordinary unity in our community, and we did things that other people think thought were, was impossible. That's the story of America. At our best, we unify. We find common cause and common purpose. The differences amongst us Democrats on the stage are not as great as the urgency for us to unite as a party, not just to beat Donald Trump, but to unite America in common cause and common purpose. That's why I'm running for president, and that's how I will lead this nation. Entrepreneur Andrew Yang. In America today, everything revolves around the almighty dollar. Our schools, our hospitals, our media, even our government. It's why we don't trust our institutions anymore. We have to get our country working for us again, instead of the other way around. We have to see ourselves as the owners and shareholders of this democracy, rather than inputs into a giant machine. When you donate money to a presidential campaign, what happens? The politician spends the money on TV ads and consultants, and you hope it works out. It's time to trust ourselves more than our politicians. That's why I'm going to do something unprecedented tonight. My campaign will now give a freedom dividend of $1,000 a month for an entire year to 10 American families, someone watching this at home right now. If you believe that you can solve your own problems better than any politician, go to yang2020.com and tell us how $1,000 a month will help you do just that. This is how we will get our country working for us again, the American people. <laughs> Mayor Pete Buttigieg. It's original, I'll give you that. <laughs> the American people are divided and doubtful at the very moment we need to rise to some of the greatest challenges we've ever seen. As a mayor of an industrial city coming back from the brink, as a veteran of the war in Afghanistan, I know what's at stake in our national leadership. We keep sending politicians to Washington, asking them to fight for us, but then when they get there, they seem more interested in the part about fighting than the part about us. Good politics is supposed to be not about the day-to-day -day fights of the politicians, but about the day-to-day -day lives of Americans. We just marked the anniversary of 9-11. All day today, I've been thinking about September 12th, the way it felt when for a moment we came together as a country. Imagine if we had been able to sustain that unity. Imagine what would be possible right now with ideas that are bold enough to meet the challenges of our time, but big enough as well that they could unify the American people. That's what presidential leadership can do. That's what the presidency is for, and that is why I'm asking for your vote. Senator Kamala Harris. Thank you, it's great to be back at TSU. So I plan on spending tonight talking with you about my plans to address the problems that keep you up at night. But first, I have a few words for Donald Trump, who we all know is watching. So President Trump, you spent the last two and a half years full time trying to sow hate and division among us. As, and that is why we've got nothing done. You have used hate, intimidation, fear, and over 12,000 lies as a way to distract from your failed policies and your broken promises. The only reason you've not been indicted is because there was a memo in the Department of Justice that says a sitting president cannot be charged with a crime. But here's what you don't get. What you don't get is that the American people are so much better than this. And we know that the vast majority of us have so much more in common than what separates us, regardless of our race, where we live, or the party with which we're registered to vote. And I plan on focusing on our common issues, our common hopes and desires, and in that way, unifying our country, winning this election, and turning the page for America. And now, President Trump, you can go back to watching Fox News. Senator Bernie Sanders. Senator Sanders. Uh, let me be blunt and tell you what you don't hear much about in Congress or in the media. 
And that is, it goes without saying that we must and will defeat Trump, the most dangerous president in the history of this country. But we must do more. We must do more. We have got to recognize that this country is moving into an oligarchic form of society where a handful of billionaires control the economic and political life of this country. And as president, I am prepared to take them on. Yes, we will raise the minimum wage to a living wage. Yes, we will finally make sure that every American has health care as a human right, not a privilege. And yes, we will address the catastrophic crisis of climate change and transform our energy system away from fossil fuel. Senator Elizabeth Warren. So I was born and raised in Oklahoma, but I'm sure glad to be in Texas tonight. All three of my brothers served in military bases here in Texas. That was their ticket to the middle class. Me, I got my big opportunity about a half mile down the road from here at the University of Houston back when it cost $50 a semester for a price that I could pay for on a part-time waitressing job. I got to finish my four-year degree and I became a special needs teacher. And after law school, my first big job was back here in Houston. By then, I had two little kids. And when childcare nearly brought me down, my Aunt B moved in and saved us all. The paths to America's middle class have gotten a lot smaller and a lot narrower. Today, service members are preyed upon by predatory lenders. Students are crushed by debt and families cannot afford childcare. I know what's broken, I know how to fix it, and I'm gonna lead the fight to get it done. Vice President Joe Biden. You know, when President Kennedy announced the moonshot, he used the phrase that sticks with me my whole life. He said, we're doing it because we refuse to postpone. Well, I refuse to postpone one more minute, spending billions of dollars on curing cancer, Alzheimer's, and other diseases, which if we invest in them, we can find cures. I refuse to postpone giving every single child in America, no matter their zip code, pre-K all the way through high school and beyond. I refuse to postpone any longer taking on climate change and leading the world in taking on climate change. Look, this is the United States of America. There's never been a single solitary time when we've set our mind to something we've been unable to do it. We're walking around with our heads down like, woe is me. We're the best equipped nation in the world to take this on. It's no longer time to postpone. We should get moving. There's enormous, enormous opportunities once we get rid of Donald Trump. Andrew Yang drops his offer, um, which was that, you know, 10 families were going to get $1,000 a year, you know, $12,000 a year, $120,000 total. Month. Uh, yeah, yeah, $12,000 yeah, 12, a year. Month. $1,000 a, yeah, $1, a month. Yeah. Yeah. $12,000 a month. I'm in. <laughs> wow. Hold on. Let me go check out his website again. <laughs> it's Yang 3030. <laughs> yeah. 30330. Yeah. Um, so that was, that was interesting. Um, I, you know, Hey, more power to him. I think I saw a story on Politico the other day that he's being investigated for like, breaking campaign law or something by you're, yeah. you're not allowed to give money to people or something. I, I read the headline. I didn't really read the article. It was, yeah. it was kind of a baller move, you know? Yeah. I saw like, uh, or I heard of this American life episode about his campaign and how he's doing that. And he had to apparently when, when he would go to the people's houses to present them with the first thousand dollars, he had mm. to just take a picture with a thousand dollars and then, the campaign had to like, or some outside thing had to mail him a check because it would be illegal for him to just like literally hand people money to <laughs> vote for them. <laughs> I don't know. So now I'm joined in the studio by Ben Calhoun. Hey there. Hey. So uh, you went out with one of the 20 or so underdogs in the race, Andrew Yang. And Yang, I think, is interesting because he's actually managed to get a lot more attention than most of the underdogs. Yeah. He's been doing things like getting on cable shows 
profiles in Vanity Fair, Washington Post. Um, and so now he's in this position where he's just trying to fan like whatever little flames he's kindled up until this point. And he's gotten that attention uh, because, well, if you know who this guy is, he's this tech guy, former businessman who organized his whole campaign around this one idea. Yeah. And the idea is that we should give every working age American a thousand dollars a month. Because what Yang says is he says this whole country is in this big crisis where workers are being replaced by automation and technology. And he thinks that when Democrats usually talk about this, their solutions are weak sauce. Like, he says job retraining programs. Democrats talk about that a lot. Yeah, retraining, job retraining. And he says the studies show that they don't work for most people. And most people kind of feel that in their gut. Um, Because it is bull. Uh, And... National politicians will talk about retraining till they're blue in the face. They love it <laughs> um, because they're far from the group of people that are getting displaced. But if you get close, I was at a truck stop here in Iowa, uh, Iowa 80, and you walk around there talking about retraining those guys, you'll probably get like, uh, you know, fist to the face. <laughs> it, it's irresponsible to talk about that as a, a mass solution. So $1,000 a month, which Yang admits, you know, it's not enough for somebody to live on, but he says it's enough to keep somebody afloat. Uh The name for that is Universal Basic Income, UBI. Yang's calling his version of this the Freedom Dividend. Um, But so I went to go see him. He's going to demonstrate how this would work by actually giving somebody $1,000 a month, like no strings attached. For a year? A whole year out of his pocket. Okay. So tell what happened. So the night before this thing, I'm in the car with Yang and his campaign, and I've been recording them all day. Now it's like 9.30 p.m. Everybody's pretty tired. So it's an hour and a half from here. We need to be somewhere at 10.45. And they're talking about this UBI event. Yang's like, I'm so psyched. But then right away, there's this logistical problem. To give away $1,000, you need to hand people something. And he doesn't have a thousand dollars on it. What they want to do is like, uh, I gotta stop by an ATM. Okay, it's pretty much impossible to hear. I'm way in the back. I'm behind Yang's campaign manager, Zach Grauman, and Yang. They're up in front. So I'm just gonna tell you how a lot of this dialogue goes. In that tape, there, Yang says, "I need to stop by an ATM and get a lot of cash, right?" Because Ed McMahon doesn't show up at your house and just tell you you've won Publishers Clearing House. That would be lame. You take a photo with a big check. So Yang's like, I got to get out a bunch of cash, to which his campaign manager says, well... Uh, so you cannot give cash. We need to think about this. Um, uh, so you cannot give cash. We need to think about this, he says. And he gives this big sigh. Because shockingly, the Federal Elections Commission has a problem with a candidate for president giving a voter $12,000 in cash. Go figure. But also, apparently, it's fine if that money comes in the form of a check. Again, go figure. Questions start flying. Does anybody have a check? Hey, what about Don? Don's son probably has a check, right? Don's son does a check. I can go to a bank and get a check. Yang, meantime, gets out his wallet and starts counting how much cash he has on him. $270, it turns out. And then he starts asking how much ATM limits are. How about a cashier's check, someone says, at a Walgreens on Sunday morning. She's like, getting getting to a Walgreens before 9 a.m. tomorrow. I'm in a car with a candidate for the presidency of the United States of America, who's trying to sell the marquee idea of his campaign, the concept he thinks will save America. And the question of the moment is, can you get a cashier's check at a Walgreens in Des Moines on Sunday morning before 9 a.m.? The next day, we go to the house of the Freedom Dividend recipients, Kyle and Pam Christensen. At this point, the campaign hasn't told them they're getting the money, just that they're being considered as finalists. Yang isn't with us. He's waiting to make a surprise entrance. His staff was not able to get a cashier's check. So instead, Yang has a grand in $20 bills. That means that legally, the campaign is going to have to hand the Christensen's money for this photo op, but then take it back afterwards and promise to mail them a check. Which seems really pretty tacky to me. But everyone with the Yang campaign is like, we'll figure it out. 
Hi. I'm Zach. I'm Pam. Nice to meet you in person, Pam Hawaii. Hi. Hi. The campaign, I gotta say, picked a really lovely family to get this. Kyle, the son, is 41. He'd applied for this freedom dividend on behalf of his mom. About four years ago, the family lost Kyle's dad, Merle, to brain cancer. They seem like such a tight, loving family. Merle was a musician, and in their house, every Wednesday, it was music night. They'd play records, Kiss, Black Sabbath. Merle would play drums and the kids would dance around, which is how I suppose Kyle ended up being a musician too. Anyway, about a year after Merle died, Pam was also diagnosed with cancer. The day she was diagnosed, her birthday, her boss called her to tell her he was firing her because she'd had to miss too much work. Pam worked as an aide for disabled adults, which she said was hard, but she loved it. After that, Kyle dedicated himself to taking care of Pam. And Pam, now in remission, still has a hard time getting around. Kyle's been piecing together work, auto repair, computer repair, music work when he can get it. But it's hard, making sure he's there for his mom. The monthly bills are about $1,300, and they barely get covered. So $1,000 would mean a lot. Kyle, though, he says he'd like to see his mom spend at least some of this imaginary money, even just a little, on something genuinely frivolous. Yeah, I'd just like to see her just, you know, just go buy something because she wants to and not out of necessity. Yeah. But there's priorities, too, so... Well, what are some of the things that, um, you know, I feel like you get sick, those bills pile up, you start to give things up. What, I mean, what are some of the things that, that you've given up in the last few years? Can you talk about, like, what we, like, have given up or sold or that kind of stuff? Yeah, oh, just okay. like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Since I know I've, been tighter. Yeah, I know for me, I, I, I used to have a full-blown recording studio here in town. And I've always kind of held on to all that equipment, hoping to set one up somewhere. Um, I've, I've sold darn near all that equipment and just kind of bare, you know, bare bones, bare minimum. I sold my last two guitars I could possibly part with last week. <laughs> so, um, so, oh my gosh, there's Andrew Yang himself. <laughs> oh, yes. Kyle later told me when he'd asked the campaign if Yang was coming, a staffer he was talking to on the phone hesitated and then said no in this way that Kyle figured Yang probably was coming. But he and Pam both act surprised. Andrew Yang offers to take off his shoes in the house. Nope, nope, you're fine. I am Asian. No, come on. I'll kick him off. Hi, Mr. Yang, how are you? I'm doing great. You must be Pam. Yes, I'm Pam. Uh, uh, thank you for having me here. Yes. So I'm here to let you know that you will be receiving the Iowa Freedom Dividend starting July 1st. Oh, so yeah. congratulations. Oh. Yeah. And, uh, really, if Yang did this for everyone, me so much if he gave every adult $12,000 a year, uh, it would cost the government $2 trillion, uh, give or take. Uh, the current federal budget is $4 trillion. Uh, so we're talking about a massive realignment of the economy and redistribution of wealth. Yang has projections on how all this could be paid for, and they include some very optimistic assumptions, all for a theory that's never been tested on anywhere near this scale. Yang starts to explain to the Christensen's how this is going to work for them, but mostly he tells them how grateful he is to help them out, in a way that feels pretty nice, actually and kind of drains a little awkwardness out of a very manufactured situation. Uh, so we need to do this for people all over the country. Um, but starting here with you all to illustrate the fact that if people get some extra money in their hands, it's just going to go to the things that we care about and value. I mean, it's, it's an awesome opportunity for us. So thank you. Great. Thank Make you. it possible. Give thank me a hug. A lot. <laughs> that means so much. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. You guys are very, very welcome. Mm. The next 45 minutes are completely usual and unusual. Yang genuinely asks Pam and Kyle about their situation, Pam's neuropathy, her treatment. He talks again and again about how much he admires Kyle for taking care of his mom. Kyle talks about the one doctor's appointment he's missed in the last three years. They talk about music, how Kyle quit the metal band he was touring with because he loved performing, but he never had an interest in the drinking and drugs that went with it. They laugh about Yang's flag socks. He talks about picking them out. Like so little of political campaigning, it's unrushed enough to feel regular. Until it's time to go. 
And the surreal logistics of a political campaign break through this small bubble of normality. Yang has to hit the road. I feel like this is a weird and particular thing you see when politicians campaign. So many of their interactions are superficial and crassly abbreviated. And then sometimes, like in this room, they'll just drift into a space with some voters that feels intense and authentic and personal. And then poof, time to go. Before Yang's got to leave, though, they have to pose for pictures. They have to pose with the cash, the cash they need but won't be allowed to keep. After the pictures, they'll hand it back. For now, Yang pulls out this huge wad of 20s. Pam, with some struggle, stands up, and Yang hands each of them a stack. Yeah, can you fan it? Can you fan it? They fan out the money, and then they look for which lens to smile into. There you go. This pile's bigger than mine. Not that I'm counting, but... This is for Instagram. Ben Calhoun. Hey, Ben. Yeah. I see in the poll numbers that he's he's still stuck at the bottom. Yeah, I mean, not the bottom, bottom. It's so crazy that people aren't voting for this. It reminds me of, um, I knew somebody who was an editor at Playboy magazine. Like, once the internet hit and Maxim and all those magazines hit, and it was like Playboy was printing pornography and people wouldn't buy the magazine. And that's what I feel like this is. It's like he's giving away $12,000 <laughs> to everybody, you know, who'll vote for him, and people still don't want it. Uh, the, the the family did say that they are going to caucus for him uh, if he's still around in January when the caucuses happen. Somebody, there, there's some old quote, and, you know, what is an old quote these days? You see a million things on Facebook and stuff where, you know, they put some famous person, they put Washington or Lincoln or somebody, you know, Benjamin Franklin's face on a thing and say he said, you know, Samsung sucks, buy an iPhone or something. <laughs> But um, it's so. But there's that that old like that old quote like um, democracy will truly fail when the you know politicians realize that the American people's votes can be bought with money. It's like we're well past that. You know, all the tax stuff the Republicans have been doing for as long as I've been alive. Um, you know, right. it's all about give people money. You know whatever it's it's all buying votes basically so you know if andrew yang is a little bit more explicit about that i'm i'm kosher with it so um andrew yang said something very interesting later in the debate which i really liked actually so um we I he mean, expanded we'll talk about out from his uh you know signature program the freedom dividend i thought i thought he talked more expansively about other issues than he had in the past which maybe he was like okay i've staked my claim to this freedom dividend, now I can stretch out a little bit. Because I thought he was a little less one note than he had been previously. Well, Maybe it's just because he had more time to speak, I don't know. But I, th- I think his um, I think that his other idea that we may get to later, but I, I can't remember if I wrote it down or not, was, mm-hmm. I forget what he called it, it's, you know, the patriotism dividend or something. or the Oh, the, the was, democracy dollars, yeah. There, there you go. I mean, this guy, he is a, he's an American capitalist, Democrats, democracy, uh, marketing. He's got know. that branding. He knows how yeah. to do it. Yeah. Well, he may he may give Trump a run for his money on branding, but um, yeah, the democracy dollars, like give every citizen in America a hundred dollars that they they can spend or not spend, but if they spend it, they have to spend it donating it to politicians that they support. And I think it's mm-hmm. I think it's brilliant because it does, you know, it, it it's it's another step up in the uh, campaign finance cold war that's going on between normal people and you know billionaires and organizations that just buy politicians so right uh, i think it's i think it's brilliant i i you know i think it's a great idea i think it's you know it's i don't know it, it's it would cost a lot of money you give a hundred dollars to every single american citizen to do this i you know that's that money has to come from somewhere and stuff but it's mm-hmm. it's you know you know how much should a country pay to return democracy? We've got, you know, issues in this country that are, you know, 90, 95, 96% approval rating and they don't get done because moneyed interests don't want them to get done. You know, mm-hmm. uh, wh- what price are you going to put on rectifying that situation? Cause we don't, we don't have, you know, we don't have the kind of government that people like to think that we have, I mm-hmm. guess. Right. So, no, that's a good point. Yeah. So Yang Gang, 
uh, <laughs> thank you. I was for, in you know, I was in the uh, Jimmy John's parking lot going through to Starbucks. There were that two. That sounds like a prime gang gang hangout. Yeah. Let me let me tell you, I saw two separate cars on different sides of the parking lot. Gang 2020 didn't look mm-hmm. like they knew each other, and nobody else had any <laughs> stickers at all. See, it's out there. It's real. <laughs> Jimmy John's yeah. is, is proof. <laughs> yeah, they're in that delivery economy, trying to yeah. get those Yang bucks. <laughs> you know, I think I. Okay, Bob, I just came up with a good slogan for him. Um, right. Get more Yang for your buck. <laughs> How about that? Somebody call this man. <laughs> yeah. Andrew Yang. You can send the check directly to Jonathan Fowler. <laughs> yeah. Get more Yang for your buck. There you go. How many won would that be a month for you? <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's yeah, that's a little over. It's going to be over a million. <laughs> there's, all, there's this T-shirt when I my first two years in Korea, there were this there was this T-shirt company called Babo Shirts dot com. Uh-huh. Sometimes I wonder if they're still out there, but I never really check their website or anything. But um, <laughs> not I enough hope to they actually are find anyway. out. Yeah, I I hope they're still out there actually because they had some clever shirts. But one of them was on the front. It says I'm a millionaire, and then on the back it says in Korean won, because <laughs> like a million won is roughly a thousand dollars. So it's like I have at least a thousand dollars. Oh wow, <laughs> <laughs> clever shirt. That's funny. Yeah. So, yeah, so mad props to Andrew Yang on that. That was, uh, you know, I don't think he got enough. I mean, everybody made a big deal about the thousand dollars a month for 10 families or whatever, which is, you know, it's a nice thing. It's a, it's good to have him, you know, demonstrate proof of concept or whatever on that. That's uh, that's good. But um, but, yeah, I, I thought the, the democracy dollars thing was quite, um, quite fascinating, quite good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've heard him say that before, but I'm glad he brought that one out. That was a good, good concept. I think it addresses a very real problem in a unique way. So, yeah, we we need more things to bring people's actual voices back to, you know, all this all this political nihilism we have, you know, the the Trump thing and stuff. I mean, you can't quantify it, but how much of that is because people realize that mm-hmm. the things they want don't get done, you know. They don't have a voice in the system anymore. So anything that that gives people a little bit more say and more power and also probably gets more people involved, because if you if if somebody tells you, hey, you've got one hundred dollars to your name, go give it to whoever you want to give it to. um, You're going to you know, you might do a little more research. You might be a little more curious about who you should give it to. You might. uh, You know, of course, it also could just be a massive popularity contest where everybody's like, oh, Joe Biden, I know that name. Oh. Here, take my money. <laughs> so. Yeah. Oh, anyways, I, Bob, I know we're, you know, meandering all over the place here, but one thing we probably should have addressed before we even started this was Trump's latest. Um, oh, yeah. What, what, what's the word? Protectionism? Uh, racketeering? Uh, uh, yeah, closer. Treason? To pre- yeah. Um, I mean, it's a it's a it's old school mob protection racket, right? I mean, yeah, my yeah, my good friend uh, Vladimir Putin's knocking on your door here, but um, you know, my Congress for some reason approved what is it, two hundred and forty million dollars for you? But I'm gonna hold that up. But if you were to produce some information about my biggest challenging competitor's son, mm-hmm. a private citizen, and his activities in this country, which you know, oh, I've got various things to say about that. Um, <laughs> uh, well, maybe we could send the money, and also maybe we could send an extra hundred million or so on top of that if you if you do what we want. Now we don't know that's what he said, but I mean he's all but admitted it. Rudy Giuliani has all but admitted it on TV. Mm-hmm. Uh, incoherent vampire, you know, <laughs> whatever the hell he is. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Did you t- ask the Ukraine to investigate Joe Biden? No, actually, I didn't. I asked the Ukraine to investigate the allegations that there was interference in the election of 2016 by the Ukrainians for the benefit of Hillary Clinton, for which there already is a court finding. You never asked anything about Hunter Biden. You never asked anything about Joe Biden. The only thing I asked about Joe Biden is to get to the bottom of how it was that Lutsenko, who was appointed, right. dismissed the case against So you did ask Ukraine to look into Joe Biden? Of course I did. 
You just said you didn't. No, I didn't ask him to look into Joe Biden. I asked him to look into the allegations that related to my client, which tangentially involved Joe Biden in a massive bribery scheme. Rudy. Not unlike Rudy. what he did in China. Rudy. You explain to me how the kid got $1.5 billion Rudy, from China. I have no problem when Joe with Biden you launching allegations. But just be careful about what you say. I asked you, did I you ask Ukraine to look at I Joe said. Biden? You said no. Then I you went on ask- to say that you did. That, no, all, I didn't it's all say recorded. that. What really? I said was this. I asked them to investigate the allegations that relate to the false charges against the president of the United States. Those allegations tangentially involve Biden. So your answer the, should have let been me yes. finish. Did the president talk to the Ukrainian president about what he wanted done with Joe Biden and what he wanted done with Paul Manafort? I have no idea. I never asked him that. I don't know if he did. And I wouldn't care if he did. He had every right to do it as the president of the United States. He had every right to say to the Ukrainian president, we have two outstanding allegations of massive corruption. And did he ask you to do what you were doing? No, I did what I did on my own. And then really? I told him about it afterwards because I'm his lawyer and I know how to investigate. So you never talked and to I, him about it before. You only talked to him about it after. Three months after I found out about it. And then I found out that it was true by getting signed, sworn statements from five people in the Ukraine who said that we were brought into the White House the Obama White House, and we were told, go dig up dirt on Trump and Manafort in January of 2016. You have no idea how big this is because you're I blinded. Love, give you're me, blinded give me the by your prejudice. Give me the affidavits. I appreciate I'm the not going to give you the insults. affidavits. Why, I'm going to give them in court. I'm not going to give so them go to present you. Them. Who are you? Who are you? Oh give my, them I'm a journalist. Court. You keep uh, saying that. Hold, hold on, Rudy, Rudy. You can't indict you, anybody. You want to say I won't cover it because I'm like this, right? You say. Um, oh, man. When I, when but I now watch you the won't give me the proof. show, I'm not going to give you proof. Well, what can you do? You can't indict anybody. I, so Believe what? me. The proof is in the right hands. I, I feel like an incoherent vampire tonight, though. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have much room to talk there, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did I say incoherent vampire? No, I mean, I'm not. I, I'm not that. <laughs> you just said you were. Wait a minute, Rudy. Oh, you said that. <laughs> <Not> <laughs> me. Drop the audio in there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. But I mean, this is the this is the consequence of uh, good old Nancy not holding him accountable when she should have. And now he thinks he can do anything. And guess what? He may yeah. be right. Because, I mean, how are you going to take a stand on this when you didn't take a stand on something else? You know, how are you going to draw the line here? You didn't draw the line there, you know? No, I think so. you can still draw the line in the national re- sigh, a collective sigh of relief when you do. But the point is real. I mean, Trump, we've known for a long time, Trump is going to keep pushing and pushing and pushing as long as there's no real resistance. And when he gets resistance, he may push further. He may get bogged down fighting that one point. We don't know. But we don't know because we've never, nobody has ever stepped up to try to actually stop him. Mm-hmm. And there's a very legitimate argument that he may never have even gotten around to talking to the new president of the Ukraine about this offer if anybody had tried to hold him responsible for Russia. Mm-hmm. And everybody who's still arguing at this late date that, oh, he he didn't do anything with Russia. He's proven innocent by the uh, Mueller report. Bullshit. You know, this is you, you, you can you know, this is a pattern of behavior. He mm-hmm. got away with it on Russia, so he tried it with the Ukraine, too. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and it's like, okay, if, if somebody gets off a of murder bee for something, <laughs> and then they get out of court that day, and they go out and they shoot somebody else, and they were, they were found innocent of the thing, you're going to look back at that trial and say, you know what, maybe we got something wrong. <laughs> because this person just killed again. It, it's like, yeah, they were found innocent, but probably they actually did the first murder, too. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this is, you know... It's uh, so I, I don't buy the bullshit. I mean, we, we all know we know he did something. So, yeah, I don't know. I'm not my most I'm not my most uh, eloquent here tonight. <laughs> but It's yeah, it's fascinating. Well, and, you know, people are always uh, going, you know, and this this applies to Kavanaugh, 
too, mm. you know, and uh, we, with the revelations we've had about him again recently, but everyone's like, yeah. oh, yeah, what, what are you going to do? Are you going to make everybody account for their high school beha- misbehaviors? And it's like, okay, well, all right, well, look how he, re- he reacted. And the same thing with Trump. Look how he reacted when the Russia stuff was brought. Did he act like somebody who was guilty or somebody who was innocent? Mm. If, if, or somebody who is at least remorseful or self-reflective. Like, like, no, both times they, they push back harder. They, how dare you, you know, insult me. And then like, I thought Kavanaugh shouldn't have been confirmed just based on the fact of how he reacted to that and how he said, we're going to reap the whirlwind and like the Clintons and partisan, like, how is that a fair judge? Like just that alone, stop with this other stuff that alone is disqualifying. You know, and yeah. so everyone's like, oh, like you said, Russia, oh, Russia, nothing was proved. It's like, well, there was a memo from the DOJ that Mueller followed and he said he couldn't make that determination. Barr jumped in. Mueller didn't say anything. Let it happen. And now we have what we have. But, you know, why did why did Trump lie about it every single step of the way if it was all kosher above board? I mean, mm-hmm. it's because he knew he did something wrong. He shouldn't have done it. And if he had been innocent or thought he was innocent, he wouldn't have acted like that. And everybody knows it. So, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, there's so much projection on the Republican side, like they've been talking about activist judges and, you know, Mm -hmm. you know, political appointee judges and stuff who just want to do their political thing for so long on the Democratic side. And again, it's because that's what they do. They appoint somebody Mm -hmm. who comes out yelling at the Democrats and talking about Democratic. he, He sounds like a Donald Trump acolyte. And they and that we're supposed to respect this guy's legitimate judge on the Supreme Court. Bullshit. No, you know, and I, I, you know, I think we've talked before about how legitimate the Supreme Court even is at this point. I'm not mm-hmm. sure that, it, you know, I mean. I mean, let's keep it real. I mean, you know, the, the Republicans are going to do what they're going to do. You know, one or two justices who may flip flop now and again, notwithstanding and. You know, frankly, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is going to do what she's going to do. And we all know that these are, you know, these are all partisan people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, that's not the idea of the Supreme Court. That's not what the Supreme Court was supposed to be. And mm-hmm. yet in 2019, that's what the Supreme Court is. Yeah. And I'm not exactly. saying the next Democrat shouldn't appoint political appointees to the Supreme Court or whatever. I mean, like politically people, we know where they're at on the political spectrum because, you know, when Russia is building nuclear weapons, you don't stop building nuclear weapons. Basically, that's the logic of, of <laughs> this kind of a battle, you know, it's, mm-hmm. but, you know, there should be some sort of a bipartisan recognition. That this is not the vision our founders had. Right. We mm-hmm. want wise people who look at the merits of an issue from exactly. a nonpartisan perspective. So mm-hmm. um, anyways, I've kind of taken us off track here, but, <laughs> you know. Uh, presidential behavior that makes Richard Nixon look like a choir boy mm-hmm. in the, within the past week is uh, noteworthy. Oh, yeah. So, well, there were opening statements. Um, I don't know. Bernie Sanders was quite hoarse. His voice was not in good condition for this debate. I noticed that. I'm, I'm worried about the guy. Um, He's running himself ragged, I think. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, I think he's, you know, he's been given some burn burning speeches, I'm sure somewhere in the past days before this, but, you know, he didn't take off after this debate and his numbers do seem to be kind of stagnating a little bit, which worries Mm -hmm. me. And, you know, I'm Bernie ride or die and stuff. So, uh, and I, you know, there's whatever 20% of the democratic electorate that basically is too. And, you know, hopefully that's going to be enough, but nothing seems to take Biden down enough. I know we're still early in the process, but and I feel mm-hmm. like, you know, um Elizabeth Warren's being built up so they can drag her down again after she takes Biden off the top and stuff. We'll mm-hmm. we'll see what happens. We'll see, you know, that twenty percent may grow. I mean, you know, Biden's support's pretty soft and I think Bernie's support is pretty solid, so mm-hmm. hopefully that means something, but I hope we're not gonna do another twenty sixteen here. Yeah. Um, okay, so our first uh, first issue was health care. Vice President Biden, the differences between you and the senators on either side of you tonight strike at the heart of this primary debate. Both Senators Warren and Sanders want to replace Obamacare 
With Medicare for all, you want to build an Obamacare, not scrap it. They propose spending far more than you to combat climate change and tackle student loan debt, and they would raise more in taxes than you to pay for their programs. Are Senators Warren and Sanders pushing too far beyond where Democrats want to go and where the country needs to go? That'll be for the voters to decide that question. Let me tell you what I think. I think we should have a debate on health care. I think uh, I know that the senator says she's for Bernie. Well, I'm for Barack. I think the Obamacare worked. I think the way in which we add to it, replace everything that's been cut, add a public option, guarantee that everyone will be able to have affordable assurance, number one. Number two, I think we should be in a position of taking a look at what costs are. My plan for health care costs a lot of money. It costs $740 billion. It doesn't cost $30 trillion. $3.4 trillion a year, it turns out, is twice what the entire federal budget is. That's before it exists now, without interest on the debt. How are we going to pay for it? I want to hear tonight how that's happened. So as far as my distinguished friend, the senator on my left, is not, has not indicated how she pays for it. And the senator has, in fact, come forward and said how he's going to pay for it, but it gets him about halfway there. There's a lot of other things that need to be done. I have a bold plan to deal with making sure we triple the money for at-risk schools that are uh, Title I schools from, 40, from uh, 15 to $45 billion a year. But I go down the line, and each of the things we're talking about, I lay out how I can pay for it, how I can get it done, and why it's better. Senator Warren, let me, let me take that to you, particularly on what Senator Biden was saying there uh, about health care. He's actually praised Bernie Sanders for being candid about his health care plan. That Senator says that Senator Sanders has been candid about the fact that middle class taxes are going to go up and most of private insurance is going to be eliminated. Will you make that same admission? So let's be clear about health care and let's actually start where Vice President did. We all owe a huge debt to President Obama who fundamentally transformed health care in America and committed this country to health care for every human being. And now the question is, how best can we improve on it? And I believe the best way we can do that is we make sure that everybody gets covered by health care at the lowest possible cost. How do we pay for it? We pay for it. Those at the very top, the richest individuals and the biggest corporations, are going to pay more. And middle class families are going to pay less. That's how this is going to work. Direct question. You said middle class families are going to pay less, but will middle class taxes go up to pay for the program? I know you believe that the deductibles and the premiums will go down. Will middle class taxes go up? Will private insurance be eliminated? Look, what families have to deal with is cost, total cost. That's what they have to deal with. And understand, families are paying for their health care today. Families pay every time an insurance company says, sorry, you can't see that specialist. Every time an insurance company says, sorry, that doctor is out of network. Sorry, we are not covering that prescription. Families are paying every time they don't get a prescription filled because they can't pay for it. They don't have a lump checked out because they can't afford the copay. What we're talking about here is what's going to happen in families' pockets, what's going to happen in their budgets. And the answer is on Medicare for all. Costs are going to go up for wealthier individuals and costs are going to go up for giant corporations. But for hardworking families across this country, costs are going to go down, and that's how it should work under Medicare for all in our health care system. Senator Sanders, you were invoked by the Vice President. Also take on that question about taxes. Uh, Joe said that uh, Medicare for all would cost over $30 trillion. That's right, Joe. Status quo over 10 years will be $50 trillion. Every study done shows that Medicare for all is the most cost-effective approach to providing health care to every man, woman, and child in this country. I, who wrote the damn bill, if I may say so, <laughs> intend to eliminate all out-of-pocket expenses, all deductibles, all co-payments. Nobody in America will pay more than $200 a year for prescription drugs because we're going to stand up to the greed and corruption and price fixing of the pharmaceutical industry. We need 
We need a health care system that guarantees health care to all people, as every other major country does, not a system which provides $100 billion a year in profit for the drug companies and the insurance companies. And to tell you how absurd the system is, tonight on ABC, the healthcare industry will be advertising, telling you how bad Medicare for all is because they want to protect their profits. That is absurd. Vice if President I could Biden, respond, you involved, George. You get, the, you get a response, then we're going to broaden out the discussion. Okay, number one, my health care plan does significantly cut the cost of the largest out-of-pocket payment you'll pay is $1,000. You'll be able to get into a, anyone who can't afford it, gets automatically enrolled in the, in, in, in the Medicare-type option we have, et cetera. But guess what? Of the 160 million people who like their health care now, they can keep it. If they don't like it, they can leave, <clears throat> number one. Number two. The fact of the matter is, we're in a situation where, if you notice, he hadn't answered the question. This is about candor, honesty, big ideas. Well, let's have a big idea. The, the tax of 2 percent that the senator is talking about, that raises about $3 billion. Guess what? That leaves you about $28 billion short. The senator said before, it's going to cost you in your pay. There will be a deductible in your paycheck. You're going to, the middle class person, someone making 60 grand with three kids, they're going to end up paying $5,000 more. They're going to end up paying 4% more on their income tax. That's a reality. Now, it's not a bad idea if you like it. I don't like it. Okay, now I want everybody to keep to the time, but you did invoke both senators. I have to get responses to them, and then we sure, will go on out. Good. Senator Warren, you go first. So, Let's be clear, I, I've actually never met anybody who likes their health insurance company. I've met people who like their doctors. I've met people who like their nurses. I've met people who like their pharmacists. I've like, met people who like their physical therapists. What they want is access to health care. And we just need to be clear about what Medicare for All is all about. Instead of paying premiums into insurance companies and then having insurance companies build their profits by saying no to coverage. We're going to do this by saying everyone is covered by Medicare for All. Every health care provider is covered. And the only question here in terms of difference is where to send the bill. Senator Sanders. Let us be clear, Joe. In the United States of America, we are spending twice as much per capita on health care as the Canadians or any other major country on Earth. This America. Yeah, but Americans don't want to pay twice as much as other countries. And they guarantee health care to all people. On the, my Medicare for all proposal, when you don't pay out of pocket and you don't pay premiums, maybe you have run into people who love their premiums. I have it. What people want is cost-effective health care. Medicare for all will save the average American substantial sums of money on his or her health care Senator, bill. Senator Klobuchar, you said in your opening statement you, don't, you want to represent the people stuck in the middle of the extremes. Who represents the extreme on this stage? I, I think you know that I don't agree with some of these proposals up here, George. So I'm talking Which about ones? If, I could, if I could respond to some of the proposals but from my friends. First of all, Senator Sanders and I have worked valiantly to bring down the cost of pharmaceuticals. That was a Klobuchar-Sanders amendment to allow for drugs to come in from less expensive countries like Canada. We Great. have worked to bring down the cost by fighting to allow 43 million seniors, that's a bill I lead, to negotiate for better prices under Medicare. I figure that's a lot of seniors and they should be allowed to get a better price. But when it comes to our health care and when it comes to our premiums, I go with the doctor's creed, which is do no harm. And while Bernie wrote the bill, I read the bill. And on page eight, on page eight of the bill, it says that we will no longer have private insurance as we know it. And that means that 149 million Americans will no longer be able to have their current insurance. That's in four years. I don't think that's a bold idea. I think it's a bad idea. And what I favor is something that what Barack Obama wanted to do from the very beginning, and that is a public option, a nonprofit choice that will bring down the cost of insurance, cover 12 million more people, and bring down the prices for 13 million more people. That is a bold idea. Senator Warren. 
Page 8 of the bill, she says, 149 people will lose their health insurance. I, I'm sorry. She said, page 8 of the bill, 149 people will lose their health insurance. What current health insurance? 149 million. Million, excuse me. Sir, let's be clear about this. People will have access to all of their doctors, all of their nurses, their community hospitals, their rural hospitals, doctors won't have to hire people to fill out crazy forms. They won't have to spend time on the phone arguing with insurance companies. People who have sick family members won't have to get into these battles. What this is about is making sure that we have the most efficient way possible to pay for health care for everyone in this country. Insurance companies last year sucked $23 billion in profits out of the system. How did they make that money? Every one of those $23 billion was made by an insurance company saying no to your health care. Um, I, I can't read my writing. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're the future of journalism, Bob. I know, exactly. <laughs> okay. Um, Biden said, I have pay place plans place plants uh, plants oh man i can't i don't know okay uh warren said we all owe a debt to obama um <laughs> yeah uh let's see warren called out the right-wing framing by george stephanopoulos of a question uh, where he said you know you know elizabeth warren you've said that uh americans will save money but that means that they'll lose their private health insurance i don't know you'll have to drop the audio in there i can't remember the exact wording of the question even though i watched it an hour ago but um right mayor buddha judge the the problem senator sanders with that damn bill that you wrote that. and that senator warren backs is that it doesn't trust the american people i trust you to choose what makes the most sense for you not my way or the highway now look I think we do have to go far beyond tinkering with the ACA. I propose Medicare for all who want it. We take a version of Medicare, we make it available for the American people, and if we're right as progressives that that public alternative is better, then the American people will figure that out for themselves. I trust the American people to make the right choice for them. Why don't you? Senator Sanders, 45 seconds. George, you talked about, was it 150 million people on private insurance? 50 million of those people lose their private insurance every year when they quit their jobs or when they go unemployed or their employer changes their insurance policy. Medicare for all is comprehensive health care, covers all basic needs, including home health care. It allows you to go to any doctor you want, which many private insurance company programs do not. So if you want comprehensive health care, freedom of choice regarding doctor or hospital, no more than $200 a year for prescription drugs, taking on the drug companies and the insurance companies, moving to Medicare for all is the way to go. Senator Harris, you started out co-sponsoring Senator Sanders' bill. You now say you're uncomfortable with it. Why? I want to give credit first to Barack Obama for really bringing us this far. We would not be here if he hadn't the courage, the talent, or the will to see us this far. I want to give credit to Bernie. Take credit, Bernie. Um, you, you know, you brought us this far in Medicare for All. I support Medicare for All, I always have, but I wanted to make the plan better, which I did, which is about offering people choice, not taking that from them. So under my Medicare for All plan, People have the choice of a private plan or a public plan because that's what people want. And I agree we shouldn't take choice from people. But here's the thing. Everybody on this stage, I do believe, is well-intentioned and wants that all Americans have coverage and recognizes that right now 30 million Americans don't have coverage. But at least five people have talked some repeatedly on this subject. And not once have we talked about Donald Trump. So let's talk about the fact that Donald Trump came into office and spent almost the entire first year of his term trying to get rid of the Affordable Care Act. We all fought against it, and then the late, great John McCain, at that moment at about 2 o'clock in the morning, killed his 
attempt to take health care from millions of people in this country. Fast forward to today and what is happening. Donald Trump's Department of Justice is trying to get rid of the Affordable Care Act. Donald Trump's administration is trying to get rid of the, the, the ban that we placed on, on denying people who have pre-existing conditions coverage. Donald Trump is trying to say that our kids up to the age of 26 can no longer be on our plans. And frankly, I think this discussion has given the American public a headache. What they want to know is that they're going to have health care and cost will not be a barrier to getting it. But let's focus and on the end goal. If we don't get Donald Trump out of office, he's going to get rid of all of it. George, question, 15 Congress. seconds. 15 seconds. Let me get to Congressman O'Rourke and then bring you. Go ahead, Mr. Vice 15 President. 15 seconds. Look, everybody says we want an option. The option I'm proposing is a Medicare for all, in a Medicare for choice. If you want Medicare, if you lose the job from your insurance company, from your employer, you automatically can buy into this. You don't have no pre-existing condition can stop you from buying in. You get covered, period. And if you notice, nobody's yet said how much it's going to cost the taxpayer. I hear this large savings. The president thinks, uh, my friend from Vermont thinks that the employer is going to give you back if you negotiate his union all these years, got a cut in wages because you got insurance. They're going to give back that money to the employee? Matter of fact, they will. Well, let me tell you bill. something. For a, socialist, you got a, you, for a socialist, you got a lot more confidence in corporate America than I do. Okay, Senator Sanders. Minute, George. Go ahead. All right. Two points. You got to defend the fact that today, not only do we have 87 million people uninsured and underinsured, you got to defend the fact that 500,000 Americans are going bankrupt. You know why they're going bankrupt? Because they suffered a terrible disease, cancer or heart disease. Under my legislation, people will not go into financial ruin because they suffered with a diagnosis of cancer. And our program is the only one that does that. I know a lot about cancer. Let me tell you something. It's personal to me. Let me tell you something. Every single person who is diagnosed with cancer or any other disease can automatically become part of this plan. They will not go bankrupt because of that. They will not go bankrupt because of that. They can join immediately. And we're talking four, six, eight, ten years, depending on you talk about, before we get to Medicare for all. Come on. I've been there. You've been there. You know what it's like. People need help now, hope now, and do something now. Congressman O'Rourke. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Listen, um, I'm grateful that we all agree about the urgency of this challenge and the fact that Donald Trump is undermining the limited protections that we have right now. But I also think we're being offered a false choice between those who propose an all or nothing gambit, forcing tens of millions off of insurance that they like that works for them to force them onto Medicare, and others who want to, as the Vice President does, incrementally improve what we have, which will still leave many, maybe millions, uninsured and uncared for in a state like Texas, where the largest provider of mental health care services is the county jail system. We've got to do better. In my proposal, Medicare for America says everyone who's uninsured will be enrolled in Medicare. Everyone who's insufficiently insured, cannot afford it, can move over to Medicare. And those, like members of unions, who fought for the health care plans that work for them and their families are able to keep them. That is this the is, best possible path forward. This is the, healthcare is the top issue for everyone in the country. I want to make sure everyone gets one minute to respond. So Con Senator Secretary Castro, Andrew Yang, and then Sen Senator Booker, you uh, all get a minute. Uh, thank you. And you know, I also want to recognize uh, the work that Bernie has done on this. Uh, and of course, uh, we owe a debt of gratitude to President Barack Obama. Uh, of course, I also work for President Obama, uh, Vice President Biden, and I know that the problem with your plan is that it leaves 10 million people uncovered. Now, on the last debate stage in Detroit, you said that wasn't true when Senator Harris brought that up. There was a, a fact check of that, and they said that was true. Uh, you know, I grew up with a grandmother who had type 2 diabetes, and I watched her condition get worse and worse. Uh, but that whole time, she had Medicare. Uh, I want every single American family to have a strong Medicare plan available. 
If they choose to hold on to strong, solid private health insurance, I believe they should be able to do that. But the difference between what I support and what you support, Vice President Biden, is that you require them to opt in. And I would not require them to opt in. They would automatically be enrolled. They wouldn't have to buy in. That's a big difference because Barack Obama's vision was not to leave 10 million people uncovered. They, he wanted every single person in this country covered. My plan would do that. Your plan would they not. They do not have to buy in. They do not have to buy in. You just said that. You just said that two minutes ago. You just said two minutes ago that they would have to buy in. You said they would have to buy in. They would have to buy in. If she qualifies for Are you forgetting what you said two minutes ago? Are you forgetting already what you said just two minutes ago? I mean, I can't believe that you said two minutes ago that they had to buy in, and now you're saying they don't have to buy You're forgetting that. I said anyone I mean, like look, your grandmother who look, has no money. We need she a would, health care system you're automatically that automatically enrolled. enrolls people regardless of whether they choose to opt in or not. If you lose your job, for instance, his, his health care plan would not automatically enroll you. You would have to opt in. My health care plan would. That's a big difference. I'm fulfilling, fulfilling the legacy of Barack Obama, and you're not. I'll be surprised to him. Andrew Yang. This is why come presidential on, guys, debates on. are becoming unwatchable. Yeah. Yeah, where, this where reminds everybody of what they cannot can I, stand about Washington. Scoring I, points against each other, can poking I, at each other, and telling each other that, that you're my plan, your plan. Look, we all yeah, That's have called a Democratic primary election. <laughs> that's called an election. That's an election. You know? This is what we're here for. It's an election. Yeah, but a house, a house divided cannot stand. And that is not how we're Look, gonna win everyone, this we election. know we're on the same team here. We know we're on the same team. We all have a better vision for health care than our current president. And I believe we're talking about this the wrong way. As someone who has run a business, I know that our current health care system makes it harder to hire people, makes it harder to give them benefits and treat them as full time employees. You instead pretend they're contractors. It's harder to change jobs. It's certainly harder to start a business. The pitch we have to make to the American people is we will get the health care weight off of your backs and then unleash the hopes and dreams of the American people. Senator Booker, now, I am Asian, so I know a lot of doctors, and they tell me that they spend a lot of time on paperwork, avoiding being sued, and navigating the insurance bureaucracy. We have to change the incentives so instead of revenue and activity, people are focused on our health in the healthcare system. And the Cleveland Clinic, where they're paid not based upon how many procedures they prescribe, shocker, they prescribe fewer procedures, and patient health stays the same or improves. That is the pitch to the American people. Senator Booker, close out this discussion. Thank you very much. Look, there are, there are a lot of people watching at home right now, listening to us, that are afraid because they are in crisis. They don't have health insurance. Their health insurance doesn't go far enough. They can't afford their prescription drugs. Look, I, I'm clear in what I believe. I believe in Medicare for all. I believe it's the best way to rationalize the system. But dear God, I know that every one of my colleagues on this stage is in favor of universal health coverage and comes at this with the best of intentions. And I'll tell you, there is an urgency right now in this nation. Everybody feels it. And as a person who has an ideal, I know we cannot sacrifice progress on the altar of purity. Because people in my community, they need help right now. They have high blood pressure right now. They have unaffordable insulin right now. And this must be a moment where we as Democrats can begin to show that we can not only stake and stand our ground, but find common ground. Because we've got one shot to make Donald Trump a one-term president. And we cannot lose it by the way we talk about each other or demonize and degrade each other. We can walk and chew gum at the same time. If I am the leader, I will work towards the ideal of health insurance, health coverage being a right for all Americans, but every single day I'll join with other Democrats to make progress happen in our nation for the people that are struggling and suffering today. It was bad. Um, uh, Biden said there will be a deductible in your paycheck. And at one point, they said something to Bernie like, uh, you've criticized that Americans pay twice as much as their, for their medicines as people in some other countries or more. And he said, yeah, I have for something. And Biden said, this is America. It's like, what, what does that mean? <laughs> like, we can afford it. <laughs> we like it. We accept it. What, what is it? This is America that we should pay more for our, our medicine that we invent largely. You know, we invent the medicine and we pay a hell of a lot more for it and give it out 
cheaper to other countries, which, you know, I'm not saying raise the price on other countries, but I'm saying, you know, it's American tax dollars that fund a lot of the research into these things. And so by that, you know, understanding, we've already paid for a lot of this stuff with our own money. So, oh. let's see. Um, Bernie Sanders said that, you know, because Biden had criticized him, said your your plan cost 30 trillion, Bernie. And he's like, well, yeah, it's 30, 30 trillion. But the status quo right now costs 50 trillion a year or something mm-hmm. or, or over 10 years or whatever the figure was. Um, Bernie said, I wrote the damn bill, by the way, or something again. I'm like, again, Bernie, you're I mean, Bernie loves that of, line. I know. I, I he wish really, he, he was really happy with on. himself for that one. <laughs> I know it's it's better when Bernie's in the moment rather than kind of trying to do a greatest hits, you know, mm. compendium or whatever. Yeah. I wish you would not try to do these callbacks to these these lines that worked the first time necessarily. But yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm. Amy Klobuchar said Bernie wrote the bill, but I read the bill after she said something like I've helped sponsor, you know, sponsor legislation with Bernie before. But then she's like criticizing his health care bill. Bye, Felicia. <laughs> yeah. And 149 million people will lose their health insurance under oh Medicare for all or something, whatever he said. Yeah, people, yeah, these right wing talking bots. Like, I mean, yeah, 100, 149 people will lose their health insurance. And you know what, Amy Klobuchar? Like, how many how many GM workers who are on strike right now lost their health insurance because yeah. the company's using it as. Uh, they're using the union members as a uh, health insurance yeah. as a bargaining chip yeah. to bring them back to work. I, so, I, I think it was Joe Biden that made a slip of the tongue that was very revealing. He started out saying he he wanted to say health insurance, but then he said like uh, employer insurance. Like he, he was like basically giving away the game that it's like all tied to your employer and that's what he wants to keep. And that's the problem, like you're saying, like, because they can if they can give it to you, they can take it away from you. So if if your employer wants to use that as a bargaining chip, they can. And we're seeing that with these striking workers right now. So if we take that power away from them and just give it to everybody, it's, you know, of course, I'm sure conservatives say the same thing about the government. So I guess there's two. Who do you trust less, I guess? But yeah, well, I don't know. Yeah, that's that's the. uh conservative and libertarian conundrum is that they they have remarkably little faith in the government yet they have unending faith in private <laughs> private companies and corporations to, to do things right. that the government right like the gut like these these people give a shit so mm-hmm. um let's see uh let's see Buttigieg said the problem senator sanders with the damn bill that you wrote <laughs> so he's you know people are turning that line against him <laughs> So another reason to stop stop using that line. Yeah. Harris said Medicare for all basically plus choice. Lol. So she was trying to again. I think the question was something like Senator Harris, you came out in support of medical for, care for all, but then you kind of backed away from it and da 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 da. And she's like, well, I I, I want Medicare for all plus choice. It's like I don't again. Uh, I'm. Th- this is the thing about watching so many debates again and again and again is you see the same bullshit arguments get used again and again, even mm-hmm. though they're debunked after each debate, which is that, well, I think like the thing is Medicare for all doesn't work if a whole bunch of people opt out until they get sick and then they choose to jump in or something and you know, or whatever, yeah. you know, like, I mean, OK, if they want to pay supplementary health insurance for private insurance and then they find that they have to pay huge deductibles and stuff when their their uh public health insurance covers most of it anyways or what i'm uh, it's exasperating (laughs) i'm sorry i'm barely coherent but it's it's neither are they (laughs) um let's see castro julian castro challenged biden for the obama legacy Mm. yeah i thought julian castro was feeling himself a lot i think he was uh, still high off his takedown of Beto in the first uh, debate, and he was like uh, ready to take Joe Joe down a, a notch here for this one. I think I can especially feeling himself because I think he was on home turf because they were in Texas. 
So I yeah. think that's where his like when when you sent me that map of supporters before about who's donating where, like his heat map was like pretty much all Texas. So mm -hmm. and so it was Spados, obviously, but yeah, yeah. Well, he went after Biden. I mean, um, and this is this may have been the you know one of the big moments from this debate. Um, mm -hmm. uh, he said, you know, he said something. Oh God, Bob, drop the audio in here and make us both look smart, because <laughs> because it was you know he picked up on some little thing that like, uh, God, can you remember what the what the issue was? He said because like he said Biden forgot what he said two minutes ago, yeah. which was that that you couldn't opt in, but then you could opt in if you, yeah. you couldn't afford the copay or something, mm -hmm. but you could opt in at that point or something. But he said, but you said you couldn't opt in two minutes ago, but it's like, I'm, I i do not know, Bob, make us look smart because I'll, uh, I'll do it. Yep. This is, this is two weeks ago. <laughs> it's, it's been a long time. It was rehashed like 50 times in think pieces and stuff in the week after the debate. And the consensus seemed to be that, what Castro sounded good and stuff, but actually on the facts, like Biden hadn't said what he thought, what he'd said he had said or something. And, and, you know, the backlash against Castro, I think was out of proportion. I mean, he was trying to get a hit on, on Biden and he, you know, hitting Biden on forgetting what he said two minutes ago is probably not a wrong tactic to take mm -hmm. considering, well, not, not only considering age, but considering mental acuity and stuff, which, Biden has not demonstrated a lot of and stuff in the past few months. Yeah, it was it was a fair point, but it was pretty ham handed the way he uh, delivered it, I guess. So. Hmm. Yeah, my mom didn't like it. I think we talked about it a week or two ago. My mom didn't like it. She was like, yeah. I thought it was, you know, not was, nice or something. Yeah, it was, it was it was a cheap shot. But I mean, it not not necessarily wrong. I mean, I feel like you know, Grandpa Joe's had some. <laughs> had some had some moments, some, some senior moments. Yeah, uh, but yeah, I think Buttigieg tried to grandstand on in here, and this is what people don't like about the debates. Know. Is, you know, da 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 da. We're criticizing and da 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 da. da. And mm -hmm. I thought Castro had a good point. He said, "This is a debate. You know, this is a democratic debate. We're here to you know highlight our differences and stuff." Yeah. And so, and also, good point yeah. to him. But also thought it was interesting earlier in that debate when uh, Stephanopoulos. After he asked the first question, I forget who he asked it to, it was like, he asked about, like, I think he asked Elizabeth Warren something about Joe Biden, or he would, the, the question included the person, and then when he went back to them, he's like, your name has been invoked by them. It's like, no, that name was invoked by you. You're trying to set up this confrontation. Like, stop pretending like someone else invoked this name. You did. It's, it's just own it. You know, you you just want this reality show moment right now where we're clashing, so this is, yeah. <laughs> Well, we're living in a reality show nation at this point, so. Exactly. Um, yeah, I, I I also thought one thing that was kind of interesting throughout the night, I think, was that quite often, either through the the question, the host, the what do you call it, the moderator's question, or through, you know, one of the centrist Democrats' attacks, uh, both Bernie and Elizabeth Warren would be invoked at the same time, and I'm not sure if it was every single time. But at least throughout the healthcare section, I think throughout the whole night, they uh, they always gave Elizabeth Warren the first response. Mm. And so that that may have hurt Bernie and stuff, because, you know, she's the one who's seen as the one challenging Biden and coming back on him strongly and stuff right after what he said and stuff. And mm -hmm. Bernie's kind of like this also ran kind of guy who's also jumping in there as a tag team guy. But, you know, not not the primary objector or whatever. So, mm hmm. Um. Yeah, I don't know. That's most of what I had on healthcare. I think. Um, I think the next one was racism. Mm. Congressman O'Rourke, coming to you first. Why are you the most qualified candidate to address this divide? You know, I've called this out in no uncertain terms on August third and every day since then, and I was talking about it long before then as well. Racism in America is endemic. It is foundational. We can mark the creation of this country not at the 4th of July, 1776, but August 20th, 1619, when the first kidnapped African was brought to this country against his will and in bondage and as a slave, built the greatness and the success and the wealth that neither he nor his descendants would ever be able to fully participate in and enjoy. 
We have to be able to answer this challenge, and it is found in our education system where in Texas, a five-year-old child in kindergarten is five times as likely to be disciplined or suspended or expelled based on the color of their skin. In our health care system, where there is a maternal mortality crisis three times as deadly for women of color, or the fact that there's ten times the wealth in white America than there is in black America, I'm going to follow Sheila Jackson Lee's lead and sign into law a reparations bill that will allow us to address this at its foundations. But we will also call out the fact that we have a white supremacist in the White House, and he poses a mortal threat to people of color all across this country. Secretary Castro, 45 seconds to respond. Yeah. You know, and, uh, I want to commend Bethel for how well he has spoken uh, to the, the passion and the frustration and the sadness after what happened in his hometown of El Paso. He's done a great job with that. Look, um, a few weeks ago, uh, a shooter drove 10 miles inspired by this pre 10 hours inspired by this president uh, to kill people who look like me and people who look like my family. White supremacy is a growing threat to this country, and we have to root it out. I'm proud that I put forward a plan to disarm hate. I'm also proud that I was the first to put forward a police reform plan because we're not going to have any more Laquan McDonald's or Eric Garner's or Michael Brown's or Pamela Turner's or Walter Scott's or Sandra Bland here from the Houston area. We need to root out racism, and I believe that we can do that because that doesn't represent the vast majority of Americans who do have a good heart. They also need a leader to match that, and I will be a president that matches that. Senator Booker, you have said, quote, the real question isn't who is or isn't a racist. It's who's going to do something about it. Senator, what do you plan to do about it? Well, first and foremost, I want to hit that point because we know Donald Trump's a racist, but there is no red bag of courage for calling him that. If racism exists. The question isn't who, in, who isn't a racist. It's who is and isn't doing something about racism. And this is not just an issue that started yesterday. It's not just an issue that we hear a president that can't contemn white supremacy. We have systemic racism that is eroding our nation from health care to the criminal justice system. And it's nice to go all the way back to slavery, but dear God, we have a criminal justice system that is so racially biased, we have more African Americans under criminal supervision today than all the slaves in 1850. We have to come at this issue attacking systemic racism, having the courage to call it out, and having a plan to do something about it. If I am president of the United States, we will create an office in the White House to deal with the problem of white supremacy and hate crimes. And we will make sure that systemic racism is dealt with in substantive plans from criminal justice reform to the disparities in health care to even one that we don't talk about enough, which is the racism that we see in environmental injustice in communities of color all around this country. Mayor Buttigieg, you've been struggling with issues around race in your own community. You've also said that anyone who votes to re-elect President Trump is at best looking the other way on racism. Does that sort of talk alienate voters and potentially deepen divisions in our country? I believe what's deepened divisions in the country is the conduct of this president, and we have a chance to change all of that. Look, systemic racism preceded this president, and even when we defeat him, it will be with us. That's why we need a systemic approach to dismantle it. It's, it's not enough to just take a racist policy, replace it with a neutral one, and expect things will just get better on their own. Harms compound. In the same way that a dollar saved compound, so does a dollar stolen. And we know that the generational theft of the descendants of slaves is part of why everything from housing to education to health to employment basically puts us in two different countries. I have proposed the most comprehensive vision to tackle systemic racism in every one of these areas, marshalling as many resources as went into the Marshall Plan that rebuilt Europe, but this time a Douglas Plan that we invest right here at home to make sure that we're not only dealing with things like the over-incarceration of black Americans, but also black solutions, entrepreneurship, raising to 25 percent the target for the federal government to do business with minority-owned businesses, investing in HBCUs that are training and educating the next generation of entrepreneurs. We can and must do that, but that means transcending this framework 
that pits us against each other, that pits a single black mother of three against a displaced auto worker. Because when I come, where I come from, a lot of times that displaced auto worker is a single black mother of three. We've got to say that and bring people together. Um, Beto O'Rourke wants to sign into law a reparations bill, which uh, we've talked about before. Again, it doesn't pull well. Mm -hmm. It's not realistic. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows how it would work. I don't think. I mean, I don't know. I, one thing is we're still in the Democratic primary, and I think it's fascinating to see how these things are talked about once we get more towards the general. And, you know, not all of these people are still going to be there, but it's going to be interesting. I, I'm fascinated to see how these people would tack on these these wild issues where they go way out on the limb in the Democratic primary. But then once they have to tack back to the middle and the, the general, if they choose to do that, how they mm -hmm. how they negotiate that. And I think like reparations is an issue where you're not going to necessarily want to be talking about that in the, in the general. Although, you know, there's an argument that, um, that um, there's an argument that Trump might overreact and say something racist. And so it still could accrue to your advantage potentially. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, oh, Beto sorry. definitely uh, was was on on a, on a high after his uh, uh, response to the El Paso shooting. Uh, so I think he was he was another one that was feeling himself this time. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. I don't know. I I don't know where the polling even is anymore. Several people have gone up. I think several people have dropped out. I think Cory Booker put out a call this week that to his people that said like look if i don't get x amount of money by the end of september then you know yeah. we're gonna have to look at some real we're gonna have to take a good hard look at what our future looks like as a campaign and you know i don't know he's he's being very blunt about that but um you know i i'm glad to see that you know some people are being put into this situation where they're gonna have to consider getting out but mm -hmm. and i kind of appreciate his honesty i think you know most campaigns are never admit defeat until you drop out suddenly. <laughs> but, um, you know, <laughs> there are some intermediate steps that he is acknowledging here. So I like that, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Bill de Blasio was the most recent casualty, I believe. So. Um, okay. Yeah, I know he's out. I Was he? Okay, Bill de Blasio is out. Uh, Booker's looking to maybe get out. Do we know who else is dropped or added and stuff? Hickenlooper's out. Gillibrand's out. De Blasio's out. Uh, Swalwell, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. Who else is out? I feel like there's somebody else. Hick, Hicken, did I say Hickenlooper? Yeah, yeah Hickenlooper. that was the first one. Yeah. Um, I f yeah, I feel like there's more people too. I mean, yeah, it's it's been a it's been a whirlwind of just trying to keep up with the uh, impeachment and the uh, <laughs> the treason or whatever. Um, it's been a full time job over here. So. Probably Delaney is still still hanging on. <laughs> is Delaney still in there? God, oh, I, yeah. if, I don't think he's I don't is, think he's out yet. Oh God. Oh oh uh, oh. Uh, I know it was somebody else that didn't make the debate. Uh, Seth Moulton. I Seth Moulton, we barely knew you. Oh, he never even made one debate. <laughs> so. Honestly, I don't know who that guy is. Who is he? He's a veteran. He's a congressman. Uh, I saw okay. one interview with him. That's all I know about him. But yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, all right. Well, pour some liquor, <laughs> I suppose. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Um, there were a lot of people I didn't really write down what they said. Castro said something. Um, Booker said he wants to have an office in the White House to address white supremacy, which I don't know if an office in the White House is what's needed, but I do think like you know, more serious acknowledgement of the domestic terrorism threat and, uh, you know, a more liberal view on incitement, you know, probably things like that are things that I would like to see. Uh, by the way, what's going on in Bloomington these days, Bob? But with the farmer's market, you mean? Yeah. What's going on there? Uh, well, uh, it's a very long story, but the short version is, that uh, there's some vendors at the farmer's market who were found out, and I, I have to go back and read the stories, but it had some connection to a synagogue vandalism uh, case that I actually reported on for Nuvo. And apparently mm -hmm. in the uh, 
in the uh, FBI transcript of the interviews, they said they had been in communication with these people, which then led people to figure out that it was these vendors at the Bloomington Farmers Market that were posting on white supremacist or white identity websites, and they weren't telling people who came to the farmers market to buy their stuff. Now the farmers market is. No, wait a minute. What yes. what are you saying? They weren't telling people who came to the book. Well, I mean, market they didn't buy. advertise that they were like white supremacists at the farmers market. They were just posting this stuff online, basically yeah. anonymously. But then it was revealed that it was them. So mm. anyway. What uh, is it? The far- schooner Schooner Creek yeah, or something? Yeah, something like that. And then the farmers market in Bloomington is administrated by the city of Bloomington. So I believe that their defense was, look, we can't, we're a governmental organization. We can't limit someone's free speech, especially when they're not doing the speech that's objectionable here. So Mm -hmm. they just continued to let them be at the farmer's market. They then had to shut down the farmer's market for two weeks, I believe, because of like credible threats to safety the Blooming Foods opened a competing farmer's market that a bunch of people went to instead uh, yeah, during that, that time. Uh, then when it opened back up, there were protesters and counter-protesters, I believe one of which uh, I know some, some people were arrested, the counter-protesters. Yeah, I know I saw some of the, somebody got hit by a car, I believe. Uh, so it's... Yeah, it's a mess. It's a total mess. I think they're going to have to shut down the farmer's market. I don't see how they go forward uh, with this because these people aren't backing down and the farmers markets already said they can't stop them so uh, the only way i could see is to give it control over to a non-governmental agency and then kick them out or just shut the farmers market down altogether and let blooming foods handle it from now on because i don't i don't know it's it's a total mess so Mm -hmm. there was a new york times story about it it was it was insane Bloomington made the news. Yeah, finally, <laughs> for a horrible, horrible reason. <laughs> the East Coast elite finally pay attention to the Midwest flyover country. And the this helicopter. Is, this is what we get. They, they chop her in. <laughs> yeah, some girl that's one of my brother's friends and stuff, she's on my Facebook and stuff, and I think she said that she had gone to high school with this girl or something. So mm. local local woman, I guess, but, yeah, she took, chose a dark path Yeah. or a light path, I guess, however you look at it. <laughs> <laughs> a very very white path which um, you know i mean my take on it is is that you know i i'm sure i've bought some produce from a white supremacist in the past and just didn't know it <laughs> and i assume that at least some people who you know, not to stereotype but you know some people that are farmers are probably have leanings in that direction more rural agrarian people are probably known to be more in that vein than others so uh, as long as, you know, as long as they're clear about this is what we believe and you still choose to shop there, well, okay, fine. But, you know, if you want to just not shop there and, and be, take your business elsewhere, I think that's the what you should do. I don't know. It's 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 a mess. I understand why people are mad, but I don't know. It's – I don't think that the city should be running it, the farmer's market anymore if they can't – if they can't kick people out for this kind of stuff – because obviously it's like a poisonous thing that isn't – who wants to go to the farmer's market now You know, with the kids? I yeah. wouldn't. If you're a non-white person, um, sure. why, why in the world would you bring your family to this kind of a place? Right, exactly. I mean it's you, – you, who knows what's going to happen there? Who knows what these people are really thinking? Who knows if you're going right. to have an ugly scene? Right. Right. Like, I mean um, – and, and the thing that I was curious about was that in the reporting about this that I've read, there's mention of a previous incident at the farmer's market where, like, I didn't get – I couldn't really get a sense of what happened in any of the reporting. But it seemed like a somewhat minor thing, but there was some sort of a confrontation with customers where, like, somebody wasn't served or something or I don't know exactly. And, and like, I really want to know what that incident was because, you know. And so, Bob, if you can get me that information somehow, you're a you're – a, you're a, in, 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 What's the word in in country intrepid? <laughs> oh, <laughs> you're, intrepid, you're an intrepid yeah. rep- member of the fifth sure. estate. Is that right? Fifth estate. Sure. I think. Yeah. yeah okay. Fourth estate. I don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. I understand what you're saying. <laughs> it's like the seventh estate. I I own so many estates. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
Uh, but um, yeah, if you could figure out what the what the preceding incidents that may have happened involving this this uh, this mm-hmm. farmers market group was, I'm, I'd be fascinated because it's really weird because none of the reporting mentions what these incidents that were mentioned were, and I'm like, you know, that may have some bearing on what's going on here. You know, was it like yeah. was there a racial incident? If so, you know, if there's, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see what happens with that. But yeah. But yeah, so Booker wants an office in the White House to address white supremacy, and you know maybe that would be a good thing. Um, let's see. Booker said, "I'll release innocent people in- incarcerated, clemency to seventeen thousand people imprisoned under the old system." Okay, interesting. Yeah, I don't know the other the other people there. I don't know. I didn't write much down. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to say. Uh, the next one was guns. Um, if you couldn't get it done after Sandy Hook, why should voters give you another chance? Because I got it done before. I'm the only one up here who's ever beat the NRA. Only one ever beat the NRA nationally. I'm the guy that brought the Brady Bill into, in, the, in the focus and became law. And so that's number one. Number two, after Sandy Hook, a number of things happened. It went from a cause to a movement. Look what's happened now. Mothers. The organization, Mothers Against Violence, this, what, what gun violence. We've seen what's happened again. Now we have all these young people marching on Washington, making sure that things are going to change. There has been a sea change. Those proposals I put forward for the president had over 50 percent of, of gun, of gun of members of the NRA supporting them and overwhelmingly the rest of the people supporting them. Now the numbers are much higher because they realize what I've been saying and we've all been saying is correct. Over 90 percent of the American people think we have to get assault weapons off the street, period, and we have to get buybacks and get them out of their basements. So so the point is things have changed and things have changed a lot. And now what's happening is, and by the way, the way Beto handled, excuse me for saying Beto, what Congressman... That's all right. Beto's good. The way he handled what happened in his hometown is meaningful. To look in the eyes of those people, to see those kids, to understand those parents, you understand the heartache. But this we is the are problem. ready to do this. Thank you. Mr. Vice President, this thank you. you. You did bring up assault weapons here. You did bring up assault weapons here, and many of you on this stage have talked about executive orders. Senator Harris, you have said that you would take executive action on guns within your first 100 days, including right. banning imports of AR-15 assault weapons. That's right. President Obama, after Sandy Hook, more than 23 executive actions, and yet here we all are today. In recent days, former Vice President Biden has said about executive orders, some really talented people are seeking the nomination. They said, I'm going to issue an executive order, Biden saying there's no constitutional authority to issue that executive order when they say I'm going to eliminate assault weapons, saying you can't do it by executive order any more than Trump can do things when he says he can do it by executive order. Does the vice president have a point there? Some things you can, many things you can't. Let's let the senator answer. Well, I mean, I would just say, hey, Joe, Instead of saying, no, we can't, let's say, yes, we can. <laughs> let's be constitutional. we got a constitution. And yes, we can, because I'll tell you something. The way that I think about this is um, I've seen more autopsy photographs than I care to tell you. I have attended more police officer funerals than I care to tell you. I have hugged more mothers of homicide victims than I care to tell you. And the idea that we would wait for this Congress, which has just done nothing, to act, is just, it, it, is, it is overlooking the fact that every day in America, our babies are going to school to have drills, elementary, middle, and high school students, where they are learning about how they have to hide in a closet or crouch in a corner if there is a mass shooter roaming the hallways of their school. I was talking about this at one of my town halls, and, 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 and this child, it was eight years old probably, came up to me, it was like it was a secret between the two of us, and he tugged on my jacket and he said, I had to have one of those drills. It is traumatizing our children, El Paso, And Beto, God love you for standing so courageously in the midst of that tragedy. You know, people asked me in El Paso, they said, 
you know, because I have a long-standing record on this issue, they said, well, do you think Trump um, is responsible for what happened? And I said, well, look, I mean, obviously he didn't pull the trigger, but he's certainly been tweeting out the ammunition. Senator my, Harris, thank my, you. My, Vice President Biden, do you still stand by what you said on an no, executive what order? What I said was, the question, speak to constitutional scholars. If, in fact, we could say, by the way, you can't own the following weapons, period. They cannot be sold anymore. Check with constitutional scholars. Uh, now, Mr. You Vice can't. President, John, thank you. Could Congressman I tell you O'Rourke, what you could I want to come to you on this. I'm going to, I'm going to work down the road here, but I do want to come to Congressman O'Rourke because I know this is personal to you. El Paso is your hometown. Some on this stage have suggested a voluntary buyback for guns in this country. You've gone further. You said, quote, Americans who own AR-15s and AK-47s will have to sell them to the government, all of them. You know the critics call this confiscation. Are you proposing taking away their guns, and how would this work? I am. If it's a weapon that was designed to kill people on a battlefield, if the high-impact, high-velocity round, when it hits your body, shreds everything inside of your body because it was designed to do that so that you would bleed to death on a battlefield and not be able to get up and kill one of our soldiers. When we see that being used against children, and in Odessa, I met the mother of a 15-year-old girl who was shot by an AR-15, mm -hmm. and that mother watched her bleed to death over the course of an hour because so many other people were shot by that AR-15 in Odessa and Midland. There weren't enough ambulances to get to them in time. Hell yes, we're going to take your AR-15, your AK-47. We're not going to allow it to be used against our fellow Americans anymore. Congressman, thank you. And I want to say this. I'm listening to the people of this country. The day after I proposed doing that, I went to a gun show in Conway, Arkansas, to meet with those who are selling AR-15s and AK-47s and those who are buying those weapons. And you might be surprised there was some common ground there. Folks who said, I would willingly give that up, cut it to pieces. I don't need this weapon to hunt, to defend myself. It is a weapon of war. So let's do the right thing, but let's bring everyone in America into the conversation, Republicans, Democrats, gun owners, and non-gun owners alike. Can I make a point? Congressman, thank you. I, I want to bring in Senator Klobuchar on this, because you've often talked about your uncle and the proud hunters back home in Minnesota. So I wanted to get your response to Congressman O'Rourke tonight. Where do you stand on mandatory gun buybacks? I so appreciate what the congressman's been doing. And I want to remind people here that what unites us is so much bigger than what divides us. Everyone up here favors an assault weapon ban. Everyone up here favors magazine limitations, which, by the way, would have made a huge difference if that was in place in El Paso, in that store where all those ordinary people showed such extraordinary courage. And certainly in Dayton, Ohio, where in 30 seconds, one man guns down innocent people. The cops got there in one minute, and it still wasn't enough to save those people. That's what unites us. You know what else unites us? And I'll tell you this. What unites us is that right now, on Mitch McConnell's desk, are three bills universal background checks, closing the Charleston loophole, and passing my bill to make sure that domestic abusers don't get AK-47. Senator so Klobuchar. we want to get something done. And I personally think we should start with a voluntary, voluntary buyback program. That's what I think, David. But I want to finish this, because if you want action now, if you want action now, we got to send the message to Mitch McConnell. We can't wait until one of us gets in the White House. We have to pass those bills right now to get this done. Senator because Klobuchar. we cannot spare another innocent life. Thank you. Thank you. I want to turn to Senator Booker, because you have said just this week about guns and about the candidates on this stage that the differences do matter. Those were your words. You have argued if you need a license to drive a car in this country, you should have a license to buy a gun. Gun owners would not only have to pass a background check, they would have to obtain a federal license to buy a gun. This would require, as you know, Congress to pass legislation. If Democrats can't get universal background checks, how would you get this done? And can you name one Republican colleague of yours in the Senate right now who would be on board with this idea? So background checks and gun licensing, these are agreed to by over Overwhelmingly, the majority of Americans, 83% of Americans, agree with licensing. This is the issue. Look, I grew up in the suburbs. It was about 20 years ago that I came out of my home when I moved to inner city Newark, New Jersey, and witnessed the aftermath of a shooting. 
It's one of the reasons why shooting after shooting after shooting in neighborhoods like mine for decades, this has been a crisis for me. It's why I was the first person to come out for gun licensing. And I'm happy that uh, people like Beto O'Rourke are showing such courage now and coming forward and also now supporting licensing. But this is what I'm sorry about. I'm sorry that it had to take issues coming to my neighborhood or personally affecting Beto to suddenly make us demand change. This is a crisis of empathy in our nation. We are never going to solve this crisis if we have to wait for it to personally affect us or our neighborhood or our community before we demand action. You want to know how we get this done? We get this done by having a more courageous empathy where people don't wait for this hell to visit upon their communities. They stand up and understand the truth of what King said, that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Quick... I will lead change on this issue because I have seen what the carnage creates in communities like mine, because we forget national shootings, these, these mass shootings are tragedies, but the majority of the homicide victims come from neighborhoods like mine. Nobody has ascended to the White House that will bring more personal passion on this issue. I will fight this and bring a fight to the NRA and the corporate gun lobby like they have never seen before. Senator Booker, thank you. A quick follow-up, though, because Americans watching tonight know the reality of Congress in Washington. I asked, do you have a Republican colleague in the Senate who would be on board with this idea to get this done? You know, if, if that was the attitude when Strom Thurmond had the longest filibuster ever on civil rights, if it was this idea that we can't get it done because of the situation in the Senate, I'm looking to lead a movement. The number one reason why governments are formed is to protect the citizenry. Think about this. We have had more people die due to gun violence in my lifetime than every single war in this country combined from the Revolutionary War till now. This is not a side issue to me. It is a central issue to me. That is the kind of fight, because the majority of homicide victims, we have a mass shooting every single day in communities like mine. We must awaken a more courageous empathy in this country so that we stand together and fight together and overwhelm those Republicans who are not even representing their constituency. Because the majority of Americans, the majority of gun owners, agree with me, not the corporate gun lobby. It is time for a movement on this issue, and I will lead it. Senator Go Booker, thank you. Me. Senator Warren, I want to come to you next. Because you have actually said in recent days that there are things you can get done with Republicans in the Senate. What can you get done on gun control? So let's start by framing the problem the right way. We have a gun violence problem in this country. The mass shootings are terrible but they got all the headlines. Children die every day on streets, in neighborhoods, on playgrounds. People die from violence, from suicide and domestic abuse. We have a gun violence problem in this country, and we agree on many steps we could take to fix it. My view on this is we're gonna not, it's not gonna be one and done on this. We're gonna do it and we're gonna have to do it again and we're gonna have to come back some more until we cut the number of gun deaths in this country significantly. But here's the deal, the question we need to ask is when we've got this much support across the country, 90% of Americans want to see us do, I like registration, uh, want to see us do background checks, want to get assault weapons off the, ground, off the streets. Why doesn't it happen? And the answer is corruption, pure and simple. We have a Congress that is beholden to the gun industry. And unless we're willing to address that head on and roll back the filibuster, we're not going to get anything done on guns. I was in the United States Senate when 54 senators said, let's do background checks, let's get rid of assault weapons. And with 54 senators, it failed because of the filibuster. Until we attack the systemic problems, we can't get gun reform in this country. We've got to go straight against the industry and we've got to change Congress so it doesn't just work for the wealthy and well-connected, so it works for the people. Senator Warren, thank you. You bring up eliminating the filibuster, which means you would need simply a, a simple majority in a Republican yes. Senate to get something done. I want to turn to Senator Sanders on this, because you've said before of this, if Donald Trump supports ending the filibuster, which he's talked about himself, you should be nervous. Would you support ending the filibuster? No, but what I would support absolutely is passing major legislation 
the gun legislation the people here are talking about, Medicare for all, climate change legislation that saves the planet. I will not wait for 60 votes to make that happen. And you could do it in a variety of ways. You could do that through budget reconciliation law. You have a vice president who will, in fact, tell the Senate what is appropriate and what is not, what is in order and what is not. But I want to get back to a point that Elizabeth made, and that, in fact, in terms of gun issues, picking up on Corey and Beto and everybody else, what we are looking at is a corrupt political system. And that means whether it is the drug companies or the insurance companies or the fossil fuel industry determining what's happening in Washington, or in this case, you got an NRA, which has intimidated the President of the United States and the Republican leadership. I am proud. I am proud that year after year, I had an F rating from the NRA. And as President, I will not be intimidated by the NRA. Senator Sanders, thank uh, you. May okay. I respond? There's, can I? Biden said, I brought the Brady bill. I'm the only one to beat the NRA. O'Rourke handled El Paso well. Mm -hmm. uh, and Harris had a line. She had a pretty funny line. One of, she, had, she tried to do a couple jokey things, and this one I thought was kind of funny. She said, hey, Joe, hey, Joe, instead of saying no, we can't, how about we say yes, we can? I actually thought that was kind of a good line because it, was, it yeah. referenced the Obama administration's, you know, uh, motto, slogan. Mm -hmm. um, O'Rourke said, we're going to take your ARs. Hell yeah. Your AK-47. Okay. I don't know. O'Rourke, like, I know he's got some righteous indignation um, about, and right, rightfully so, about what happened in El Paso. Um, I'm not going to lie, though, saying we are going to come and take your ARs. I mean, that this is this is exactly what. Yeah, the NRA is like, like, thank you for the ad. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the NRA just. Uh, well, never mind. I was going to make a reference to a Lonely Island song, but. Uh, <laughs> Which one? If, if you think about it, the NRA. Well, I'm not going to say it. OK. I got nice people who listen to this podcast, Bob. <laughs> it's a family show. <laughs> the breeze rolls in and I, well, you know, you know the rest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I got Bruce it. Bruce Willis was dead at the end of Sixth Sense and I, yep. there you go. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's a, it's a wet dream for people who, think that the government and Democrats in general want to take your guns and for O'Brock mm -hmm. to come out and just say it nonchalantly like that. I mean, I don't know, man. I don't know. It's, I, it's not, I don't know. You're writing the attack ads yourself. That's, that's mm -hmm. all I'm going to say. So, um, Klobuchar says domestic abusers don't get AK 47s start voluntary, uh, differences don't matter amongst the different plans. I don't know. Um, Booker says differences do matter. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, avoids the question about finding a Republican senator to endorse endorse him about, you know, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. Drop some audio in here, Bob. Make us look smart. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember exactly what Booker's plans were on guns and you know, I'm sure in 2020 when we're actually voting, I won't have to remember either. But <laughs> for the sake of this podcast, it does matter. Yeah, right. Um, and then there was, okay, this is this is one of those issues. Warren says eliminate the filibuster, and Bernie says don't eliminate the filibuster. And I have to say, this is like one of the two or three issues where I'm going to go with Warren over Bernie on. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sorry to say it, I don't know what world he's living in where he thinks letting the you know letting the senate where republicans are overrepresented already because they have you know 25 states with like less than a million people in them or something where you know they they still get two senators on the in the senate and um, democrats have to figure out a way to what is it break a 60 60 vote 
you know, have a 60 vote majority to override a filibuster and he wants to keep the filibuster. I, I not smart. You know, I don't know. Maybe he knows something. He's in the Senate. Maybe he knows something I don't know, but I don't understand it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure what his reasoning is for that. So, Yeah, I'd love to see somebody push him on that issue. Mm-hmm. Everybody, you know, the questions people ask, the questions the mainstream media asks are so, you know, don't you worry that you're too far left? I mean, health care, Medicare for all is really expensive. You know, we just don't know if we can afford it as a country. It's oh like, gosh. Ask about the filibuster. You know, this is this is an interesting thing. This is a mm-hmm. thing where there's a legitimate difference between him and some very pe- people he's very close to. Mm-hmm. One thing I don't understand. God, I'm I'm rambling. Um, <laughs> Emma Viglin from TYT Young Turks did a interview with uh, a bunch of Warren supporters at a Warren rally somewhere, and it was fascinating. It was absolutely fascinating. Mm-hmm. To hear the reasons, because she asked them, why do you support Warren over Bernie Sanders? And she didn't push back on them at all, really, or anything. She just wanted to know because, and this is something I'm fascinated by, too, because I've seen, like, certain people in my own family who, you know, they're all about Elizabeth Warren, but mm-hmm. they fucking hate Bernie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'm like, I've seen have it you too. noticed, yeah, have you noticed that Warren and Bernie go out of their way not to attack each other? And I'm Mm -hmm. sure that they would support each other and stuff if if one of them makes it and the other one doesn't. Like, Mm -hmm. do you ever wonder why you hate this guy so much and your candidate seems to think he's the fucking, you know, the greatest thing since sliced bread, Mm -hmm. except that she wants to be president, too? Like, does that ever cause any cognitive dissonance for you? Why? Why do you hate this guy so much if Elizabeth, if your candidate doesn't seem to, you know? Yeah. Why is that? I think it's partially, I'm going to just generalize here, but I think it's partially because people see a yelly man and they're just like, oh, somebody mansplaining something to me. So maybe yeah. it maybe it doesn't read, maybe it doesn't read well to people, but I mean, he's obviously, yeah, you're like, like you said, I mean, 99.9% of the issues, they're going to be simpatico and I don't see them going out of their way to, you know, tear each other down. So yeah, just, you know, let's, let's wait and see who wins and we'll support whoever it is if that's how you feel. But you know, like, I don't know, it's, it's just as much of a thing where it's like, oh, I don't like Elizabeth Warren because she's a woman. It's like almost the opposite. It's like I don't like Bernie Sanders because he's a man yeah. saying these things. I think you know, I think the, I, I think it's you know I think it is like a reverse sexism situation in a sure. lot of people's situations. And you know I don't think that they would like to hear that. I don't think they'd like to admit that. And I don't think they could even acknowledge that to themselves. But I think they want Bernie Sanders' ideas in a female package. Mm-hmm. And and one woman that Emma Viglin even interviewed said, well, you know, Elizabeth Warren's my first choice, but my second choice is uh, Harris or something or Harris or Buttigieg. I got into Elizabeth Warren a long time ago. If you remember, no eight, the housing crisis in California, we lost our home, including everybody on my row in Sacramento, California, along with rows and rows of homes. And I couldn't understand it. I was still in high school, so I didn't understand why we lost our home, but they just said, you know, the recession, right? So as I got older, I got some researching, and I saw her and how she's been fighting and screaming at the top of her lungs about why we're going to recession, how this can bankrupt American families, and at the end of the day, what we can do about it. So then she ran for Senate, and then she's been out there being the voice of what I really have been going through. So I believe in her in my heart and soul. I understand the Bernie supporters, I get them. But Elizabeth is my heart and soul because I feel like she's really speaking to what I've been through. And I'm still a capitalist. I still believe in markets, but I believe in rules and regulations. She's not my candidate yet, 100%. I like Pete Buttigieg, but I like her, I like, I like that she has a plan. Um, it's between her and Pete Buttigieg. Oh yeah, but also maybe even Amy Klobuchar and Cory Booker. I'm not. I'm not even close to picking one person yet. But if I'm gonna go for somebody like on the left side of the spectrum, it's gonna be Elizabeth Warren as opposed to any of the others like Bernie or anybody like that. So, so why not Bernie? Um, it's time for a woman. Is all. I mean, Bernie's over and done, didn't do it the last time. I've, Elizabeth has more energy. I think she's got more intelligence. 
And it's like, wait, what? <laughs> like, what in God's name are you judging on? <laughs> like these these candidates are widely different. They have very little in common. And, and like, I mean, the only thing that they really I mean, you've got two women and a gay man. I mean, I don't know what that means, but it's like, what are you what are you judging your choices on? If this is <laughs> this is the order for you, it's it's certainly not ideology. It's certainly not ideas. It's certainly no. not anything like that. It's this is like total identity bullshit. Right. Uh huh. Or something. I don't know. Yeah. So um, th- now there, I'm not going to say that, like, you know, when you go into the comment section on YouTube or whatever, if you look under the video and stuff at all the comments, it's a nightmare. But it's but it's like they're all saying, oh, all these people are stupid. Everybody in that video is really stupid. And actually, OK, there were one or two people who I, I thought were reasonable. There's one guy who said, you know, after the 2008 financial crisis, African-American guy from California he said my family lost her home and. I found Elizabeth Warren talking about these issues and she spoke directly to my family's experience. And ever since like 2008, I've had a strong emotional connection to this candidate and I really like her. And it's like, Hey man, more power to you. You know, that's not wrong. You know, you found a candidate at the right time in your life who was speaking to you and you want to support her. Nothing wrong with that. That's a, that's a legitimate thing. Um, There was another person who mentioned that, she that uh warren supported ending the filibuster in the senate and bernie didn't and that's like i'm sorry you can criticize people who support warren over bernie all you want i prefer bernie as well but that's that's also a legitimate criticism of bernie like Mm -hmm. you know defend that right so i just i want people to be better you know like like uh trump's wife says melania just be be best right just be best I thought you were going to say, I don't really care, do you? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Mm. I just, one thing that's been maddening is just seeing how much motivative reasoning there is in in every area, I think, or in a lot of areas and stuff, in a lot of uh, news sources Mm -hmm. I trust and others that I don't trust. It's like the candidates that I don't support can do nothing right. And the candidates I do support can do nothing wrong. (laughs) You know, that's, that's very much what I see from a lot of people. Yeah. Totally. Like, um, do you, have you been watching that new show from uh, The Hill? Uh, the what's Hill? it called? They've got a new YouTube channel kind of t- TV show with uh, one liberal and one conservative. Uh, no, okay. I haven't seen it. Okay. It's like Rising. I think it's called Rising. The Hill Rising. Mm. It's got, uh, God, what's her name? What's her name? Hold on. She used to be a MSNBC news anchor, I guess, briefly, but now she, and then she ran for Congress and now she's on the Hill. She's pretty mm-hmm. good. She's pretty good on a lot of things, but she's, she's a, I don't know what the female version of a Bernie bro is, but she's definitely, one, she's one of them. And normally I like it, but there have been several videos where I'm like, okay, you know, come on, come on. You're, you're obviously just kind of hitting somebody else or something on something. Mm -hmm. Bell. I want to say her family name is bell. Um, she was okay. When you look up the, the bill Maher skit from earlier, like she's the one who reacts, like she has a reaction shot right after he says that, that, uh, Klobuchar is the compromise candidate. The camera cuts to her and she's like, Mm -hmm. what? And so she has the kind of the correct, correct reaction there. So, but she's definitely like put out some videos recently where I was kind of like, Look, we know you support Bernie, but just, I mean, be be an, be somewhat of an objective journalist about things. Like, you know, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyways, I'm sorry. I, I, you know, it's it's hard to talk about something that obviously, if you're totally unfamiliar with the show, but um, it's kind of a new rising thing on the left wing side of the political spectrum. It's crystal ball. Yes. Yes. And she's got a partner who's a right wing guy on there, Sagar or something. I forget his family name. I think he's like Indian American or something, maybe. And it's kind of like he's kind of this like nebbish little guy and stuff who can't really say much because Donald Trump is his president right now and he can't defend it. So, But he still likes to, you know, get in some barbs and stuff at Democrats and liberals here and there. And like he mm-hmm. said some shit about Jimmy Carter the other day. Poor so, Jimmy Carter. Um, <laughs> but it it really has like kind of a Hannity and Combs, uh, rest in peace, Combs, pour some liquor, yeah. kind of a vibe because you've got this one person. There's there's two partisan people on opposite sides of the spectrum, 
but one of them is obviously dominating the conversation every single time. And like the other person is just kind of like playing catch up and like, well, I, I don't disagree, but da, 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 you know, <laughs> so it's, but it, it's, it's an up and coming thing. She's, I've seen her, I think I've seen her on the young Turks and I've seen her on the majority report and all these, all these different shows and stuff. So she's, she's making the rounds and making connections. So. Yeah, I listened to that episode of Bill Maher. I didn't know who she was before that. I thought she made some good points on that episode. But Yeah, check out Rising sometime on YouTube. It's it's not a bad show, but sometimes they go a little bit far. And like, because like yesterday I saw that the conservative guy did his, his take on the Joe Biden, uh, Donald Trump thing. And he said, you know, yeah, Donald Trump was out of line, but you know what? I think we should investigate, you know, Biden's son because uh, corruption anywhere is bad and da 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 da. It sounds like they did something wrong. All right, Sagar, what are you looking at? Well, President Donald Trump has violated the sacrosanct rules of Washington, D.C. by asking Ukraine to investigate the son of potential rival former Vice President Joe Biden. This is, of course, a corrupt and illegal ask because the Washington press corps has decided once and for all there is no malfeasance whatsoever behind Hunter Biden's totally legit business dealings in Ukraine and China. Biden himself declared the case closed on Saturday, citing the lack of media coverage of Hunter's business dealings as evidence. Let's take a listen. Wait a second, wait a second. Wait a second. Not one single credible outlet has given any credibility to his assertion. Not one single one. And so I have no comment except the president should start to uh, be president. We've talked a lot about media bias in this show and how much of the elite media is a de facto arm of the ruined class. This is a great example because if the so-called credible media decides that this isn't a story, then they won't cover it. Then corrupt people get to cite their lack of coverage as the absence of evidence. Let's review the facts again, shall we? Hunter Biden made untold sums of money while his father was vice president of the United States in highly dubious and almost certainly untoward ways. Hunter was being paid $50,000 a month by a Ukrainian energy company to sit on their board. He has no background in the industry whatsoever and, of course, was on their board for one reason only, to buy influence in the United States government. To make matters even worse and even more complicated, the company was being investigated by Ukraine's government for corruption. The head of that corruption investigation was fired after intense pressure from Vice President Joe Biden while he was serving as the point person for the administration on Ukraine. Biden denies he ever spoke to his son about his business dealings, and he gets really angry if you ask him. Just take a look at how he responded to Fox News' Peter Ducey when he asked him over the weekend. I've never spoken to my son about drugs. And so how do you know? Let's talk about, here's what I know. I know Trump deserves to be investigated. He is violating every basic norm of a president. Everybody looked at this, and everybody's looked at it and said there's nothing there. Ask the right question. Do any of us really believe the Ukrainian energy company was paying Hunter Biden for anything other than political influence? As Matt Brunig of the People's Policy Project said on Twitter, Hunter Biden was on the board of Burisma because of his deep knowledge of the Ukrainian energy industry, just like Chelsea Clinton is on the board of Expedia because of her deep knowledge of the online travel agency market. If this was just run-of-the-mill corruption like the Clintons appear to have engaged in, then I guess we could all move on. But it actually gets a lot worse. Hunter accompanied his father on a 2013 trip to Beijing, catching a ride on Air Force Two. Days later, his private equity firm inked a $1 billion deal with the Chinese government, despite having literally no expertise in the subject whatsoever. I'm sensing a pattern here. Biden, coincidentally, was point person for the Obama administration's China policy at the time. I used to go to some of his speeches around here in 2016. I remember how he regaled audiences with pride, how he'd spent more time with Chinese President Xi Jinping than any other American official. You don't think that $1 billion had any influence on those conversations at all? What I've outlined to you is just what's in the public domain through the dogged work of a few reporters who refuse to swim with the mainstream. Just imagine what else is out there. We need to investigate the Bidens now. And Crystal, the reason I'm so hung up on this is because, I, I, you know, watching so much of the press corps just brush this aside mm -hmm. as a complete non-entity, 
This is what will take him down, ultimately. I, I'm absolutely convinced of it, because there is so much there, and it received absolutely no coverage. And just one subpoena could tell us even more about how much money Hunter bought. Again, this is all through lawsuits and what's in the public domain. Right. Do you know how much more there is in federal tax filings? Yeah. God knows. Well, and I mean, look. Let's not yeah. make a false equivalency here. I think what Trump did is completely unacceptable to mm. pressure Ukraine to investigate Biden for political gain. Not okay. Let's put that to the side. This is Hillary Clinton 2.0. Yeah. Does anyone really believe that Hunter Biden got these positions right. on of his no. own merit? I mean, he worked for a credit card issuer yeah. while Biden was in the Senate. This is a pattern of behavior. And frankly, it's part of the reason why we ended up with Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Because people look at this sort of routine corruption that the press typically just turns a blind eye to, but the public is sick of it. And so, no, it's not the same as Trump. Trump is way worse, but this is how he muddies the waters, and this is how he will end up getting reelected. And re the Democrats are acting like, oh, well, as long as Biden himself didn't get a $50,000 payment from the Ukrainian energy company, then it's not corruption. That's not how corruption works, people. Right. That's so, like, you know how it works? You pay a guy's son 50 grand a month, and you expect something in order to work out, and who knows if it did? Maybe we should find out. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> you know, this is this is the, the fruit of the poison tree or whatever you say. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, no, we're not going to we're not going to turn the Bidens. Uh, I don't like Joe Biden personally. I'm like, I'm not. Well, I, it's not that I don't like him, but I'm not voting for him until if unless he gets into the general. But it's like I'm not going to let Donald Trump run the narrative of, of corruption against the guy who may very well be the general candidate mm -hmm. and have everybody start investigating this guy when it sounds like, you, you know, I'm no, he doesn't get to insert that into the left wing narrative that that's mm -hmm. that we're going to start eating our own here, especially when the, 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 whatever corruption may be exposed about Biden's son or Biden himself or whatever is going to pale in comparison to the fact that Donald Trump just held up taxpayer approved money, Congress approved money for for the Ukraine to mm -hmm. get personal favors for his own his own election interests. Uh, it's absolutely, absolutely criminal. Mm -hmm. You know, nothing, nothing that the Bidens could have possibly done in the Ukraine would even compare to that. So mm -hmm. I'm not interested in going down that that road. Yeah, totally. Uh, so, <laughs> so sorry, Bob. This is a little bit debate night. This is a little bit every other damn thing too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, apparently things happen in the world outside of these debates, but who knew? <laughs> yeah, the world don't stop. So, <laughs> uh, you remember that Slim Shady from this the song, the world, the world. While the world turns, or something. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why this world keeps turning round and round, but I wish it would stop and let me off, or something. <laughs> Interesting song. Mm -hmm. mm. Um. Okay, Latinos was the next subject, I think. We've been hearing a lot about what's been happening here in in Texas. Only a few weeks ago, the deadliest massacre of Latinos. Latinos in modern U.S. history happened in this state, in El Paso. So the fear among Latinos, and you know this, is very real. So let me start with an issue that is causing a lot of division in this country, immigration. Um, Vice President Biden, as a presidential candidate in 2008, you supported the border wall saying, unlike most Democrats, I voted for 700 miles of fence. This is what you said. Then you served as vice president in an administration that deported three million people the most ever in U.S. history. Did you do anything to prevent those deportations? I mean, you've been asked this question before and refused to answer, so let me try <clears throat> once again. Are, are, are you prepared to say tonight that you and President Obama made a mistake about deportations? Why should Latinos trust you? What Latinos should look at is comparing this president to the president we have is outrageous, number one. We didn't lock people up in cages. We didn't separate families. We didn't do all of those things, number one. Number two, number two, by the time, this is the president who came along with the DACA program. No one had ever done that before. This is the president who sent a le legislation to the desk saying he wants to find a pathway for the 11 million undocumented in the United States of America. This is the president who's done a great deal. So I'm proud to have served with him. What I would do as president is several more things because things have changed. 
I would, in fact, make sure that there is, we immediately surge to the border. All those people are seeking asylum. They deserve to be heard. That's who we are. We're a nation that says if you want to flee and you're fleeing oppression, you should come. I would change the order that the president just changed, saying women who were being beaten and abused could no longer claim that as a reason for asylum. And by the way, retrospectively, you know, the 25th anniversary of the Violence Against Women Act is up. The Republican Congress has not reauthorized it. Let's put pressure on them to I pass see. the Violence Against Women Act now. But then yeah, we'll go but back. You, you didn't answer the question. Well, the question I, I did you make the question. A, no, did you make a mistake with those deportations? The president did the best thing that was able to be done at the How about time. you? I'm the vice president of the United States. Uh, Secretary Castro, uh, would you want to respond I, I to mean, Vice look, President Biden? You know, and and it, let me put this in context, because uh, your party controlled the White House and Congress in 2009 and didn't pass immigration reform. And this broke a promise made by President Barack Obama to Latinos. So why should voters trust Democrats now? I mean, now it is even more difficult, as you know, because you need Republican votes in the Senate. So are you willing, for instance, to give up DACA or give up a path to citizenship or even agree to build a wall in order to legalize 10.5 million undocumented immigrants? Jorge, thank you very much for that question. And uh, you look, I agree that Barack Obama was very different from Donald Trump. Donald Trump has a dark heart when it comes to immigrants. He built his whole political career so far on scapegoating and fear-mongering and otherizing migrants. And that's very different for Barack Obama. Um, but my problem with Vice President Biden, and Corey pointed this out last time, is every time something good about Barack Obama comes up, he says, oh, I was there, I was there, I was there. That's me too. And then every time somebody questions part of the administration that we were both part of, he says, well, that was the president. I mean, he wants to take credit for Obama's work, but not have to answer to any questions. I mean, Vice President Biden, you have, I don't get that. You have 45 uh, Jorge, seconds. Jorge, let me just say, Jorge, let me just say that I would, I was the first candidate in early April to put forward an immigration plan. You know why? Because I'm not afraid of Donald Trump on this issue. I'm not going to backpedal. I'm not going to pretend like I don't have a, my own vision for immigration. So. We're not going to give up DACA. We're not going to give up protections for anybody. I believe that on January 20th, 2021, we're going to have a Democratic president. We're going to throw out Mitch Thank McConnell you. and John Cornyn and have a Democratic Senate and a Democratic House. And we're going to pass immigration reform within the first 100 days. Vice President, 45 seconds. I did not say I don't stand. I stand with Barack Obama all eight years, good, bad, and indifferent. That's where I stand. I did not say I did not stand with him. Okay, Senator Warren, uh, hundreds of children have been separated from their parents at the border. And recently in Mississippi, we saw the largest immigration raid in a decade. You want to replace ICE, the agency in charge of rounding up undocumented immigrants. So how would you deal with the millions of immigrants who arrive legally but overstay their visas? And how would you stop hundreds of thousands of Central Americans who want to migrate to the U.S.? Well, I start with a statement of principles, and that is, in this country, immigration does not make us weaker, immigration makes us stronger. I want to see us expand legal immigration and create a pathway to citizenship for our dreamers, but also for their grandparents, and for their cousins, for people who's overstayed student visas, and for people who came here to work in the fields. I want to have a system that is a path to, to citizenship that is fair and achievable. Down at the border, we've got to rework this entirely. A system right now that cannot tell the difference in the threat posed by a terrorist, a criminal, and a 12-year-old girl is not a system that is keeping us safer, and it is not serving our values. Mr. Yang. We, we need, I want to add one more part on this, because I think we have to look at all the pieces. Why do we have a crisis at the border? In no small part, because we have withdrawn help from people in Central America who are suffering. <laughs> We need to restore that help. We need to help establish and reestablish the rule of law so that people don't feel like they have to flee for their lives. We have a crisis that Donald Trump has created and hopes to profit from politically. We have Thank to have you. the courage to stand up and fight back. Mr. Yang. 
It is true that in the last few years, we have seen the most severe anti-immigrant measures, from putting kids in cages to limiting asylum for people fleeing gangs and domestic violence. But it is also true that about one million immigrants enter the U.S. legally every year. So are you willing to raise the number of legal immigrants from one million to two million per year? And should there be a merit system, as President Trump wants? So, yeah. Oh, I'm my, sorry. Did you ask me? Or? Mr. That was me. I already said it. Okay. <laughs> sorry. My, my father grew up on a peanut farm in Asia with no floor, and now his son is running for president. That is the immigration story that we have to be able to share with the American people. If you look at our history, almost half of Fortune 500 companies were founded by their immigrants or children of immigrants, and rates of business formation are much higher in immigrant communities. We have to say to the American people, immigrants are positive for our economic and social dynamism. And I would return the level of legal immigration to the, to the point it was under the Obama-Biden administration. I think we have to compete for talent. And I am the opposite of Donald Trump in many ways. He says, build a wall. I'm going to say to immigrants, come to America, because if you come here, your son or daughter can run for president. The water is great, and this is where you want to build a company, build a family, and build a life. This country has been a magnet for human capital for generations. If we lose that, we lose something integral to our continued success, and that is where I would lead as president. Alcalde Pitt, I have a question for you. Thank you. Alcalde Pitt, eight out of 10 Latinos in Texas for another mass shooting targeting them. This is according to a new Univision poll. President Trump has called Mexican immigrants rapists and killers, tried to ban Muslims from entering the country and separated children from their parents. His supporters have chanted, build a wall and send her back. Do you think that people who support President Trump and his immigration policies are racist? Anyone who supports this is supporting racism. Este es racismo y es sencillo. The only people, though, who actually buy into this president's hateful rhetoric around immigrants are people who don't know any. We have an opportunity to build an American majority around immigration reform. In my community, a group of conservative Republicans rallied around an individual, a beloved local individual who was deported when he went into ICE to try to get his paperwork sorted out because they never thought it would happen to him. In some of the most conservative rural areas of Iowa, I have seen communities that embraced immigration grow. And it's why part of my plan for revitalizing the economies of rural America includes community renewal visas that would allow cities and towns and counties that are hurting not only for jobs but for population to embrace immigration as we have in my city. You know, the only reason that South Bend is growing right now after years of shrinking is immigration. It's one of the reasons we acted, not waiting for Washington, to create city-issued municipal IDs so that people, regardless of immigration status, in our city had the opportunity to have the benefits of identification. We have an opportunity to actually get something done, but we cannot allow this to continue to be the same debate with the same arguments and the same clever lines, often among the same people since the last real reform happened in the 1980s. We have to actually engage the American majority around the opportunities for not just growth in small communities, but our values, values Thank of you. welcome, values of faith that all argue for us to manage this humanely and in a way that marries our values with our laws. Congressista Beto Rourke, una pregunta para usted. Uh, in an interview, eight months ago, you were asked what to do with the so-called overstayers, people who come with a visa and then stay. And you said, I don't know. Uh, do you have an answer now? I do. And, and if you read the rest of that article in the Washington Post, I talked about harmonizing our entry exit system with Mexico in the same way that we do with Canada. I think that could help us to keep a handle on visa overstays. But I think the larger question that we're trying to get at is how do we rewrite this country's immigration laws in our own image, in the image of Houston, Texas, the most diverse city in the United States of America, in the image of El Paso, Texas, one of the safest cities in the United States of America, safe not despite the fact that we are a city of immigrants, safe because we are a city of immigrants. Conocemos que si queremos asegurar nuestras comunidades y nuestro país, necesitamos tratar cada persona con respeto y dignidad. I will lead an effort to make sure that we rewrite our immigration laws in that way. Never cage another child. Make sure that there is accountability and justice for the seven lives lost under our care and our custody. 
but also face the fact that Democrats and Republicans alike voted to build a wall that has produced thousands of deaths of people trying to cross to join family or to work a job, that we have been part of deporting people, hundreds of thousands, just in the Obama administration alone, who pose no threat to this country, breaking up their families. Democrats have to get off the back foot. We have to lead on this issue because we know it is right. Legalize America. Begin with those more than one million dreamers. Make them U.S. citizens right now in this, their true home country, Gracias. and extend that to their parents, their sisters, and their brothers, and ensure that we have a legal, safe, orderly system to come to this country and add to our greatness here. Somebody said, what about you and Obama, the record? Why should Latinos trust you? I don't know. I put a star by this. I don't know why. Did I write this? Was this my idea, or did somebody say this to Biden? We may never know. <laughs> Important <laughs> distinction. <laughs> yeah, Castro said Biden is an Obama hypocrite. Um, I think he was talking about like when, you know when you when Obama did something you like, you're clinging to him, and when he did something you didn't like, you're like, oh well, or something that's unpopular now, you say, well, that was Obama. I couldn't control that or something, which is mm -hmm. a fair. Fair criticism. Yeah. Yep. Um, Castro said immigration reform within the first 10 days of his presidency. Um, Warren said, are you asking me? And apparently, no, they were asking Yang at one point. So <laughs> I don't know what was going on there. Right. Um, Yang said return legal immigration to Obama era levels. Um, let's see. Buttigieg said anyone who supports this supports racism. Fair point. Um, Beto O'Rourke, Jorge Ramos set him up to speak Spanish, but he, and he did it <laughs> predictably. <laughs> so. Cory Booker did have a funny line uh, where he was like, no, and let me translate that into Spanish. No. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. When they ask these questions, though, like when, when, when Jorge Ramos like winds up these Spanish questions, I don't know. I feel like he 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 sticks it up a little bit, you know. He really like gets into it and stuff in a way that I don't think that necessarily Spanish speakers necessarily do when they're just normal Spanish speakers on normal, you know, Spanish language television. But he like, mm -hmm. I don't know, man. There's something just so it feels pandering. Mm -hmm. And and I don't think O'Rourke's Spanish is actually, you know, he responds in Spanish, but I don't know how good. It is. I don't know. Mine's worse, but like his, it does sound a little clunky, doesn't it? It does. Drop his, drop his audio in there, and we'll let the audience be the judge of how good his Spanish is. Donde está la biblioteca? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I love that movie. <laughs> Bedazzled is like low key one of my favorite movies. I think that's a great one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Hola, is a. <laughs> Hold on. Hola, Ruiz. Hola, Isabel. <laughs> no, no, no. I can't, I can't remember the lines. Oh, God. That is such a good movie. Such a quotable movie. And, like, I don't know. It, it, it really has a message. Brendan Fraser. Man, he got robbed, yo. He got robbed. Yeah. Got molested by one movie exec and got blackballed by Hollywood for 20 years. Oh, yeah? I think mm -hmm. I heard something about that. I don't think he actually got molested or something, but like he got himself out of a situation which was really uncomfortable, and then after that, mm -hmm. the movies just dried up or something. So it's really a shame. I saw, he's a, he's a I saw him the last actor. in a TV show Ash and I were watching called The Affair, okay. and he was a prison guard. Interesting. Interesting. He was yeah. He was Ash said he was not looking good. So. Yeah, he's. I mean, he's lost some of the best years of his life to Hollywood, right? Like, I mean. Yeah. I mean, yeah. but that guy, he can act his ass off. I mean, like, yeah. I mean, bedazzled. He was, he was good. He was extremely versatile. He was playing numerous different archetypes in that movie, like at least six or seven, um, mm -hmm. while maintaining a, a thread line throughout each one that was recognizable and identifiable. I mean, that's not every actor I think could do that. Um, the, the quiet American also, uh, a very good movie in some ways, but an amazing book. The book I've read multiple times is an amazing book. Mm. Definitely read The Quiet American. It's an amazing, just, yeah, Graham Greene is an amazing author. Mm. So I've got another book of his, uh, I think, Our Man in Panama or something, which I haven't read yet, but I want to read. 
I own it though. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, the, there was another section that I missed largely. And when I came back, it was troops overseas. Would you keep that promise to bring the troops home starting right now with no deal with the Taliban? Yes. And I'll tell you why. What we're doing right now in Afghanistan is not helping the safety and security of the United States. It is not helping the safety and security of the world. It is not helping the safety and security of Afghanistan. We need to bring our troops home. And then we need to make a big shift. We cannot ask our military to keep solving problems that cannot be solved militarily. We're not gonna bomb our way to a solution in Afghanistan. We need to treat the problem of terrorism as a worldwide problem. And that means we need to be working with all of our allies, our European allies, our Canadian allies, our Asian allies, our allies in Africa and in South America. We need to work together to root out terrorism. It means using all of our tools. It means economic investment. It means expanding our diplomatic efforts instead of hollowing out the State Department and deliberately making it so we have no eyes and ears in many of these countries. We need a foreign policy that is about our security and about leading on our values. Senator Warren, a quick follow on that, because top U.S. leaders, military leaders on the ground in Afghanistan told me you can't do it without a deal with the Taliban. You just said you would. You, know, you look, would bring them home. What if they the, told you that? Would you listen to their advice? I was in Afghanistan with John McCain two years ago this past summer. I think it may have been Senator McCain's last trip before he was sick. And I talked to people, we did. We talked to military leaders, American and local leaders. We talked to people on the ground and asked the question, the same one I ask on the Senate Armed Services Committee, every time one of the generals comes through, show me what winning looks like. Tell me what it looks like. And what you hear is a lot of, oh, no, no, because no one can describe it. And the reason no one can describe it is because the problems in Afghanistan are not problems that can be solved by a military. I have three older brothers who all served in the military. I understand firsthand the kind of commitment they have made. They will do anything we ask them to do, but we cannot ask them to solve problems that they alone cannot solve. We need to work with the rest of the world. We need to use our economic tools. We need to use our diplomatic tools. We need to build with our allies, and we need to make the whole world safer, not keep troops bombing in Afghanistan. Senator Warren, thank you. I do want to stay on this, and I want to turn to Mayor Buttigieg, because you're the only veteran on this stage who served in Afghanistan. We heard in recent days from General Joseph Dunford, the chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who said in recent days, I'm not going to use the word withdrawal right now. It's our judgment the Afghans need support to deal with a level of violence. If he's not even using the word withdrawal, would you put your promise to bring troops home in the first year on hold to follow the advice? You know, I served under General Dunford way under General Dunford in Afghanistan. <laughs> and today, September 12th, 2019, means that today you could be 18 years old, old enough to serve, and have not been alive on 9-11. We have got to put an end to endless war. And the way we do it is see to it that that country will never again be used for an attack against our homeland, and that does not require an open-ended commitment of ground troops. Let me say something else, because if there's one thing we've learned about Afghanistan, from Afghanistan, it's that the best way not to be caught up in endless war is to avoid starting one in the first place. And so, when I am president, an authorization for the use of military force will have a built-in three-year sunset. Congress will be required to vote, and a president will require, be required to go to Congress to seek an authorization. Because if our troops can summon the courage to go overseas, the least our members of Congress should be able to do is summon the courage to take a vote on whether they ought to be there. By the way, we also have a president right now who seems to treat troops as props, or worse, tools for his own enrichment. 
We saw what's going on with flights apparently being routed through Scotland just so people can stay at his hotels. I'll tell you, as a military officer, the very first thing that goes through your mind, the first time you ever make eye contact with somebody that you were responsible for in uniform, is do not let these men and women down. This president is doing exactly that. I will not. Mayor Buttigieg, thank you. I want to turn to Vice President Biden because the concerns about uh, any possible vacuum being created, being created in Afghanistan if you pull the U.S. troops out uh, has been heightened by what we've seen in recent days on the ground in Iraq. Uh, when you were Vice President, President Obama turned to you to bring the troops home from Iraq. You have said on the campaign trail, quote, I made sure the President turned to me and said, Joe, get our combat troops out of Iraq. There was a major drawdown of U.S. troops, and then ISIS seized, by some estimates, 40 percent of the territory in Iraq. You then had to send thousands of troops back in. Was it wrong to pull out of Iraq that quickly, and did the move actually help ISIS take hold? No, it wasn't wrong to pull out, but I want to answer an Afghanistan question. I've been in and out of Afghanistan, not with a gun, and I admire my friend uh, for his service. But I've been out of Afghanistan, I think, more than anybody on this, on this and it's an open secret. You reported a long time ago, George, that I was opposed to the surge in Afghanistan. The whole purpose of going to Afghanistan was to not have a counterinsurgency, meaning that we're going to put that country together. It can not be put together. Let me, let me say it again. It will not be put together. It's three different countries. Pakistan owns the three counties, the, the, the three provinces in the east. They're not any part of it. The Connies run it. I will go on and on, but here's the point. The point is that it's a counter-terrorism strategy. We can prevent the United States from being the victim of terror coming out of Afghanistan by providing for bases, insist that Pakistanis provide bases for us to, to airlift from and to move against what we know. We don't need those troops there. I would bring them home. And Joe Dumfort's a fine guy, but this has been an internal argument we've had for eight years. With regard to, uh, with, with regard to um, uh, Iraq, the fact of the matter is that, uh, you know, I should have never voted to give Bush the authority to go in and do what he said he was going to do. The AUMF was designed, he said, to go in and get the Security Council to vote 15 to nothing to allow inspectors to go in to determine whether or not anything was being done with chemical weapons or nuclear weapons. And when that happened, he went ahead and went anyway without any of that proof. I said something that was not meant the way I said it. I said from that point on. What I was argued against in the beginning, once he started to put the troops in, was that, in fact, we were doing it the wrong way. There was no plan. We should not be engaged. We didn't have the people with us. We didn't have our alliance. We didn't have allies with us, et cetera. And it was later, when we came to, into office, the, Barack turn, the president turned to me and said, Joe, when they said we had a plan to get out, he turned to the whole security team. Joe will organize this, get the troops home. My son spent a year in Iraq, and I understand. It made, and we were right to get the combat troops out. The big mistake that was made, which we predicted, was that you would not have a circumstance where the Shia and the Kurds would work together to keep ISIS from coming, uh, from moving in. Mr. Vice now, President, thank you. I want to turn to Senator Sanders on this because the concern over Afghanistan is very similar to what we saw in Iraq when the troops came out. ISIS filled that vacuum. What do you make of people out there who are worried that if we pull out U.S. troops too quickly from Afghanistan, it will create safe haven all over again, like the plotters of 9-11? David, let me answer that, but let me just comment on something that uh, the Vice President said. You talked about the big mistake uh, in Iraq and the surge. The truth is, the big mistake, the huge mistake, and one of the big differences between you and me, I never believed what Cheney and Bush said about Iraq. You're right. I voted against the war in Iraq and helped lead the opposition. And it's sad to say, I mean, I kind of, you know, had the feeling that there would be massive destabilization in that area uh, if we went into that war. Uh, as the former chairman of the Senate Committee on Veterans Affairs, I want to pick up on what Pete said, we cannot express our gratitude to all of the men and women who have put their lives on the line to defend them, defend us, who have responded to the call of duty. But I think also I am the only person up here to have voted against all three of Trump's military budgets. I don't think we have to spend $750 billion a year on the military. 
when we don't even know who our enemy is. I think that what we have got to do is bring this world together, bring it together on climate change, bring it together in fighting against terrorism, and make it clear that we as a planet, as a global community, will work together to help countries around the world rebuild their struggling economies and do everything that we can to rid the world of terrorism but dropping bombs on Afghanistan and Iraq was not the way to do it. <laughs> um, Warren said, bring the troops home with no Taliban deal. Buttigieg said, three-year sunset on authorization for use of force so that presidents can't just keep, you know, every three years they have to justify to Congress the continuation of the war and Congress either approves or disapproves. And I'm kind of split on that. I think, I don't know. I think, like, obviously, the use of force, which was approved back in, like, I don't know, was it 2001, 2002, 2003, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. late 2002, early 2003, sometime around there? Mm -hmm. That thing was never rescinded. And yeah. and how many how many countries have we bombed? How many places have we got troops in because of that one thing? And, you know, these forever wars and all that stuff is mm -hmm. the result of that. But at the same time, I think, you know, politicizing the use of force, Congress I don't know. You know, our government doesn't work these days. I'm not convinced that the Senate or the House could be trusted to use the authorization for the use of force responsibly, you know, to control the president. I feel like it would be politicized within the first three years. You know, they're going to say, do we like this president? Does this president want to continue the war? Well, we're going to say no, you know, just mm -hmm. because, you know, I'm Rand Paul, damn it. And <laughs> I like to throw a wrench in things every now and then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so... Yeah, I don't know. Like, I mean, I just, I don't know. We'll see. Something, yeah, something should be done about the nonstop American, you know. We we either have to have a plan to win these wars or we have to wrap them up. I don't, I don't know what the solution is. But, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think holding ground is my thing. But, mm -hmm. you know, we're not really interested in holding ground, it seems like. So, whatever. Right. Uh... Biden said something. I didn't really listen. Sanders said, I never believed what Cheney and Bush said about Iraq and Afghanistan. And I guess the implication was that Biden did because Biden allowed himself to be fooled into voting for the war or, you know, mm -hmm. it was popular at the time and he voted for it, whichever, mm -hmm. whichever explanation you prefer to believe. <laughs> um, Yang said in forever wars at this point, it kind of morphed to another topic. Sometimes, you know, they start on one topic, but then before they even get through all the people, they kind of shift to another topic randomly. Um, mm -hmm. Castro wants a 21st century Marshall Plan for Latin America. Interesting. Uh, sure. Thank you, Jorge. I'll call Maduro a dictator because he is a dictator. And uh, what we need to do is to, along with our allies, make sure that the Venezuelan people get the assistance that they need that we continue to pressure Venezuela so that they'll have free and fair elections, and also here in the United States, offer temporary protected status, TPS, to Venezuelans. That is something that the Trump administration has failed to do for all of his big talk about supporting the Venezuelan uh, American community. He has failed. I will not. I also believe that we need to do things like a 21st century Marshall Plan for Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala so that people can find safety and opportunity at home instead of having to make the dangerous journey to the United States. And uh, under my administration, we're going to put renewed focus on Latin America. It makes sense. There are neighbors, and we have a lot of things in common. It also Thank makes you. sense that because we have a country like China that is going around the world to places like Africa and Latin America, making their own relationships, strengthening those. The United States needs to strengthen its partnerships in Latin America immediately. Thank you, sir. And I will. Um, there was a question for Booker. Should more Americans be vegan like you? Se Senator Booker, uh, let me ask you about Brazil. After the recent fires in the Amazon, some experts suggested that eating less meat is one way to help the environment. You are a vegan since 2014. That's obviously a personal choice. But President Trump and Brazil's President Bolsonaro are concerned that climate change regulations could affect economic growth. So should more Americans, including those here in Texas and, and in Iowa, follow your diet? 
Um, you know, first of all, I want to say no. I, I, actually, I want to translate that into Spanish. No. Um, <laughs> Look, on, let's just be clear, uh, the factory farming going on that's assaulting this corporate consolidation in the agriculture industry, one of the reasons why I have a bill to put a moratorium on this kind of corporate consolidation is because this factory farming is destroying and hurting our environment, and you see independent family farmers being pushed out of business because of the kind of incentives we are giving that don't line up with our values. That's what I'm calling for. But I want to I switch because we don't have a crowded debate stage. We were talking about Afghanistan and Iraq. It, it, it annoys me that we had a conversation about our troops overseas, and we didn't say one word about veterans in our country. We have a shameful reality in America that we send people off to war, and they often come home with invisible wounds, hurts, and harms. They're disproportionately homeless. You hear stories about women waiting for months for gynecological care through the VA. It is very important that as we, as a country, understand that we are not going to solve every problem with this outrageous increased militarism, that we also make sure that we stand up for the people that stood for us. We end our national anthem with Home of the Brave. It's about time we make this a better home for our bravest. <laughs> and Hooker, who's a vegan, said no. Okay. <laughs> Way to stand strong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's only asking the substantive questions. <laughs> um, there was a viewer's question on climate change for O'Rourke. Um, I don't remember that question. Congressman O'Rourke, um, Hurricane Harvey hit this town two years ago, and not only is the Amazon burning, Greenland is melting at a record pace. The last five years have been the hottest ever recorded, and we have a viewer's question about this. What meaningful action will you take to reverse the effect of climate change? And can we count on you to follow through if your donors are against it? Yes, we will follow through regardless of the political consequences or who it offends, because this is the very future of our planet and our ability for our children and grandchildren to be able to survive on it. We will make sure that we get to net zero greenhouse gas emissions no later than the year 2050, that we are halfway there by 2030, that we mobilize $5 trillion over the next 10 years to do that, that we invest here in Houston, Texas with pre-disaster mitigation grants to protect those communities that are vulnerable to flooding, given the fact that this town has seen three 500-year floods in just five years. You'd like to think you're good for 1,500 years, but you're not. They're coming faster and larger and more devastating than ever. We're also going to make sure that we free ourselves from a dependence on fossil fuels fuels and embrace renewable wind and solar energy technology, as well as the high-paying, high-skill, high-wage jobs that come along with that. And then we're going to pay farmers for the environmental services that they want to provide, planting cover crops, keeping more land under conservation, using no-till farming. Regenerative agriculture can pull carbon out of the air and can drive it and sequester it into the soil. That's the way that we're going to meet this challenge, and we're going to bring everyone into the solution. Many of you want to comment. Um, let's, let's try to see if we can go very fast. Uh, Senator Klobuchar. Thank you. Uh, this is the existential crisis of our time. It's, you know, that movie, The Day After Tomorrow? It's today. Uh, we have seen a warming in our world uh, like never before. We're seeing flooding in the Midwest, flooding in Houston, fires in the West. And I think having someone leading the ticket from the Midwest will allow us to talk about this in a different way and get it done. On day one, I will get us back into the International Climate Change Agreement. On day two, I will bring back the clean power rules that President Obama had worked on. On day three, I will bring back the gas mileage standards. You can do all that without Congress, which is good. On day four, five, and six, I will, working with Congress and mayors and business people all over the country, introduce sweeping legislation to get at that Thank 2050 you. goal. And on day seven, you're supposed to rest, but I won't. Uh, Senator this Warren, is what uh, we need uh, to do if we're going to get at climate change. We have to take this on as a crisis that's happening. Right now. Senator Warren, should American foreign policy be based around the principle of climate change? Yes. 
Uh, we need to work on every front on climate change. It is the threat to every living thing on this planet, and we are running out of time. Every time the scientists go back, they say we have less and less time than we thought we had. But that means we've got to use all the tools. One of the tools we need to use are our regulatory tools. I have proposed, uh, following Governor Inslee, that we, by 2028, cut all carbon emissions from new buildings, by 2030, carbon emissions from cars, and by 2035, all carbon emissions from the manufacture of electricity. That alone, those three, will cut our emissions here in the United States by 70 percent. We can do this. We also need to help around the world to clean, but understand this one more time. Why doesn't it happen? Thank as you. long as Washington is paying more attention to money than it is to our future, we can't make the changes we need to make. We have to attack the corruption head on so that we can save our planet. Senator Harris, 45 seconds. When I think about this issue, it really is through the lens of my baby nieces who are one and a half and three years old. Uh, when I look at what is going to be the world if we do nothing when they turn 20, I'm really scared. And when I've been in the United States Senate for now the last two and a half years, and I look at our counterparts, the Republicans in the United States Senate, they must be looking at their children, and then when they look at the mirror, I don't know what they see, but it's a lack of courage. And this, this is an issue that, yes, it represents an existential threat. It is also something we can do something about. This is a problem that was created by human behaviors. And we can change our behaviors in a way that saves our planet. I've seen it happen in California. I took on, as the Attorney General of California, I ran the second largest Department of Justice in the United States, second only to the United States Department of Justice. I took on the big oil companies, and we saw progress. If any of you have been to Los Angeles Thank 20 you. years ago, you'll remember that sky was brown. You go there now, the sky is blue, and you know why? Because leader just decided to lead, and we took on these big fossil fuel companies. We have some of the most important and strongest laws Thank you. in the country, Thank you very much. and we made a difference. And my point being, I've done it before, and I will lead as president on this issue because we have no time. The clock is tipping, Thank you. ticking, and but we need courage, now. and we need courageous leadership. We can get this done. Mr. Yang. So to follow up on what Elizabeth said, why are we losing to the fossil fuel companies? Yeah. Why are we losing to the gun lobby and the NRA? And the answer is this. We all know, everyone on the stage knows, that our government has been overrun by money and corporate interests. Now, everyone here has a plan to try and curb those corporate interests, but we have to face facts. Money finds a way. Money will find its way back in. So what is the answer? The answer is to wash the money out with people-powered money. My proposal is that we give every American hundred democracy dollars that you can only give to candidates and causes that you like. This would wash out the lobbyist cash by a factor of eight to one. That is the only way we will win. And as someone running for president, I'll tell you, there's the people on one side and the money on the other. The only way for us to win is if we bring them together. Uh, Klobuchar said, I'm from the Midwest and I'm for the, the environment. Uh, let's give a cookie to her. Um, Let's see. Uh, Warren said she's going to have an American foreign policy based on climate change. Uh, 2028 carbon emissions buildings restriction. 2030 cars, climate emi carbon emissions on cars. Uh, 2035 uh, climate emission on businesses. So she, you know, she's got a plan for that, as she is wont to say. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay, let me see. There's Yang said money finds a way, money will find a way in. Wash out lobbyists, uh, eight to one with 100. Wait, citizen. Okay, um, hold on. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't know. It says eight to one. I don't know what the eight to one ratio was, but he said, um, hundred dollars citizens cash for donations very interesting I like that that was the part where we talked about earlier I think it's a great mm -hmm. idea mm -hmm. um, Andrew Yang said pro he's pro charter school 
I'm pro good teachers. Uh, don't love that. Mm -mm. Um, Mr. Yang, we'll stay with you. Here in Houston, the school district is facing yet another year of spending cuts. Like schools across the country, the system faces many challenges. One of them, thousands of students are leaving traditional public schools and going to charter schools. You're the most vocal proponent on this stage for charter schools. You have said that Democrats who want to limit them are, quote, just jumping into bed with teachers unions and doing kids a disservice. Why isn't taxpayer money better spent on fixing traditional public schools? Let me be clear, I am pro good school. I've got a kid, uh, one of my, uh, Little boys just started public school last week, and I was not there because I was running for president. <laughs> so we need to pay teachers more because the data clearly shows that a good teacher is worth his or her weight in gold. <laughs> we need to lighten up the emphasis on standardized tests, which do not measure anything fundamental about our character or human worth. But here's the big one. The data clearly shows that 65 to 70 percent of our students' outcomes are determined outside of the school. We're talking about time spent at home with the parents, words read to them when they're young, stress levels in the house, income, type of neighborhood. We're putting money into schools, and educators know this. We're saying you're 100% responsible for educating our kids, but you can only control 30%. They all know this. The answer is to put money directly into the families and neighborhoods to give our kids a chance to learn and our teachers a chance to teach. Mayor Buttigieg, 45 seconds to respond. Step one is appoint a secretary of education who actually believes in public education. I believe in public education. And in order to strengthen it, some things are very complex for preparing for a future where knowledge is at your fingertips, but we got to teach more to do with critical thinking and social and emotional learning. Some of it is extremely simple. We've just got to pay teachers more. And we've got to lift up the teaching profession. I always think of a story from South Bend of uh, friends who host exchange students from Japan. They had a student one year who wanted to be a teacher, and they kept in touch with her when she went back to Japan and to college. Uh, she took the exam to try to become a teacher uh, in a society that really regards teachers and compensates teachers well. And she came up just short. So you know what she did? Since she was academically good but couldn't quite make the cut to be a teacher, she had a fallback, fallback plan. She became a doctor. That is how seriously some countries treat the teaching profession. If we want to get the results that we expect for our children, we have to support and compensate the teaching profession, respect teachers the way we do soldiers, and pay them more like the way we do doctors. Senator Warren, to use Mr. Yang's term, are you just jumping into bed with teachers' unions? You know, I think I'm the only person on the stage who has been a public school teacher. I've wanted to be a public school teacher since I was in second grade. And let's be clear in all the ways we talk about this, money for public schools should stay in public schools, not go anywhere else. I've already made my commitment. I will, we will have a secretary of education who has been a public school teacher. I think this is ultimately about our values. I have proposed a two-cent wealth tax on the top one-tenth of one percent in this country. That would give us enough money to start with our babies by providing universal child care for every baby age zero to five, universal pre-K for every three-year-old and four-year-old in this country, Thank you, raise Senator. the wages of every child care worker and preschool teacher in this country, Cancel student loan debt for 95% of the folks who've got it. Thank you, Senator. And strengthen our unions. This is how we build an America that reflects our values, not just where the money comes from with the billionaires and corporate executives. Senator Harris, 45 seconds to respond. My first grade teacher, Mrs. Frances Wilson, God rest her soul, attended my law school graduation. I think most of us would say that we are not where we are without the teachers who believed in us. 
I have offered in this campaign a proposal to deal with this, which will be the first in the nation federal investment in closing the teacher pay gap, which is $13,500 a year. Because right now in our public schools, our teachers, 94 percent of them, are coming out of their own pocket to help pay for school supplies. And that is wrong. I also want to talk about where we are here at TSU and what it means in terms of HBCUs. I have, as part of my proposal, that we will put two trillion dollars into investing in our HBCUs for teachers because, because, because one, as a proud graduate of a historically black college and university, I will say. I will say that it is our HBCUs that disproportionately produce teachers and those who serve in these many professions. But Thank also, you, Senator. But this is a critical point. If a black child has a black teacher before the end of third grade, they are 13 percent more likely to go to college. Mm -hmm. If that child has had two black teachers, before the end of third grade, there are 32 percent more likely to go to college. So when we talk about investing in our public education system, it is at the source of so much. When we fix it, that will fix so many other things. We must invest in the Thank potential you, of our children. Senator Sanders, and I strongly believe you can judge a society based on how it treats its children, and we are Thank failing you, on this issue. Guess what? <laughs> You're guessing. All right, here's the answer. <laughs> we are the wealthiest country in the history of the world, and yet we have the highest child poverty rate of almost any country on earth. We have teachers in this country who are leaving education because they can't work two or three jobs to support That's themselves. Right which is why under my legislation we will move to see that every teacher in America makes at least $60,000 a year. What we will also do is not only have universal pre-K, we will make public colleges and universities and HBCUs debt-free. And what we will also do, because this is an incredible burden, on millions and millions of young people who did nothing wrong except try to get the education they need. We are going to cancel all student debt in this country. Thank you, Senator. And Thank we you, are Senator. going to do that by imposing a tax on Wall Street speculation. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Mr. Vice President, I want to come to you and talk to you about inequality in schools and race. In a conversation about how to deal with segregation in schools back in 1975, you told a reporter, I don't feel responsible for the sins of my father and grandfather. I feel responsible for what the situation is today, for the sins of my own generation, and I'll be damned if I feel responsible to pay for what happened 300 years ago. You said that some 40 years ago. But as you stand here tonight, what responsibility do you think that Americans need to take to repair the legacy of slavery in our country? Well, they have to deal with the, the — look, there is institutional segregation in this country. And from the time I got involved, I started dealing with that. Redlining, banks, making sure that we are in a position where — look, we talk about education. I propose that what we take is those very poor schools, the Title I schools, triple the amount of money we spend from 15 to 45 billion a year, give every single teacher a raise to the equal raise of getting out of the, the $60,000 level. Number two, make sure that we bring in to the help the, 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 the teachers deal with the problems that come from home. The problems that come from home, we need — we have one school psychologist for every 1,500 kids in America today. It's crazy. The teachers are — and I'm married to a teacher. My deceased wife is a teacher. They have every problem coming to them. We have make sure that every single child does, in fact, have three, four, and five-year-olds go to school. School, not daycare. School. We bring social workers into homes of parents to help them deal with how to raise their children. It's not that they don't want to help. They don't want — they don't know quite what to do. 
play the radio, make sure the television, the, excuse me, make sure you have the record player on at night, the, the, the phone, make sure the kids hear words. A kid coming from a very poor school, a, a very poor background, will hear four million words fewer spoken by the time they get there. There's Thank so you, much, we, no, I'm, I'm gonna go like the rest of them do, twice over, okay? <laughs> because because here, here, here's the deal. The deal is that we've got this a little backwards. And by the way, in Venezuela, we should be allowing people to come here from Venezuela. I know Maduro. I've confronted Maduro. Number two, you talk about the need to do something in Latin America. I'm the guy that came up with $740 million to see to it those three countries, in fact, change their system so people don't have a chance to leave. You're all acting like we just discovered this yesterday. Thank, thank you, thank Mr. You Vice much. President. Secretary Castro. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, that's, that's quite a lot. Uh, but, uh, you know, I grew up in one of those neighborhoods that folks have talked about, in a neighborhood that was grappling with the legacy of segregation. In fact, in two, two public school districts, uh, that were involved in a 1973 Supreme Court case challenging how Texas financed its schools. And uh, I know that today our schools are segregated because our neighborhoods are segregated. Mm -hmm. right. Now, I have an education plan like a lot of folks up here that would pay teachers more, that would recruit uh, diverse ranks of teachers, that would invest in our public schools. But I also believe that we have to connect the dots to uplift the quality of life, to invest in housing opportunity, to invest in job opportunity, to invest in community schools that offer resources like parents able to go back and get their GED and healthcare opportunities, and those things that truly, truly ensure that the entire family can prosper. Those are the types of things that we need to do in addition to lifting up our public schools. You asked a second ago about charter schools. Look. Um, it is a myth that charter schools are better than public schools. They're not. And so, Thank you, Secretary. While, while I'm not categorically against charter schools, I would require more transparency and accountability from them than is required right now. Put money into the neighborhoods, into the families, okay. Then I guess, you know, people can spend their $1,000 a month on charter schools, although that probably won't cover it. <laughs> um, no, probably not. Buttigieg contrasted with Yang on this and said, I believe in public schools, public education. Okay, good. Um, let's see, what did he, he said, respect teachers like soldiers and pay them like doctors. Okay, good line. Um, Warren said, I've been a public school teacher. Okay. Uh, I think Elizabeth Warren and Pete Buttigieg both were contrasting with Yang. They had some conflict there about the charter schools versus public schools. Mm -hmm. Harrison Biden said things about education that I didn't really feel were worth writing down. <laughs> uh, Sanders wants sixty thousand dollars a year for teachers, which I think is a good, probably a good thing. I think, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a private educator, but I have mad respect for public educators too, and I think you know mm -hmm. they should be compensated accordingly. Um, Castro said it's a myth that charter schools are better than public schools. They're not. Um, Booker said close poor performing schools. Uh, 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 what do you say? Uh, something performing, low performing charter schools and, okay, close poor performing charter schools, uh, support high-performing charter schools. So Booker's trying to walk a middle line there on that issue. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Anyways, well, rather abruptly, Bob, that brings us to the end of my notes on the Democratic debate in ABC. With I think members. we covered most of it. I think the only thing I think you didn't talk about was that last question. Instead of closing statements, they had, what was your, I forget the exact wording of the question. It was something like, what was your biggest disappointment or something? So I want to ask each of you, what's the most significant professional setback you've had to face? How did you recover from it? And what did you learn from it? Vice President Biden. I, uh, I never counted any professional setback I have as a serious setback. Uh, there's things that are important, things that are unimportant. Yeah! Mm -hmm. The, 
We're going to clear the protesters now. Just one minute. Senator Biden, we'll start the clock again. Our I'm sorry. We're sorry. Go ahead. There's setbacks and there's setbacks. And uh, I think the most critical setback that can occur to anyone is to uh, um, lose uh, — well, my, my dad had an expression. He said, Joey, it's not a question of succeeding whether you get knocked down. It's how quickly you get up. And, uh, and you say, you never explain and never complain. And then go on to say that the only obligation that really matters, the most important thing, is family. And so I was raised to believe that that was the center of everything — family. And it could be judged on based how you treat your family and, and how you went from there. And I uh, — um, it took, you know, Kierkegaard said, faith sees best in the dark. Right after I got elected, my wife and daughter were killed in an automobile accident, and my, and my, uh, my two sons are badly injured. And I'd just been elected, not sworn in. And uh, I lost my faith for a while. I came back. And then later, when my son Bo came home from Iraq and with a terminal disease, and uh, a year later, a year and a half later, losing him was like losing part of my soul. But the fact is that I learned that the way you deal with it is you deal with finding purpose, purpose in what you do. And that's why I, I hope — I hope he's proud of me today, because he wanted to make sure I didn't run for president, but I stayed engaged. Because when you get hit badly, whether you're losing a job or you're raising a family like my dad, where you have to make that longest walk up the stairs to tell your kid you can't live here anymore, dad lost his job, you know, we, we've all went through that, some form or another. And it just takes — it just, for me, the way I've dealt with it is uh, finding purpose. And my purpose is do what I've always tried to do and uh, stay engaged in public policy. And, but uh, there's a lot of people that through a lot worse than I have get up every single morning, put their feet one foot in front of another without the help I had. They're real heroes out there. Some Thank real you, Mr. Heroes. Vice President. Senator Warren. I mentioned earlier, I've known what I wanted to be since second grade. I wanted to be a public school teacher. And I invested early. I used to line my dollies up and teach school. I had a reputation for being tough but fair. Um, <laughs> by the time I graduated from high school, my family didn't have money for a college application, much less to send me off to four years at a university. Um, and my story, like a lot of stories, has a lot of twists and turns. Got a scholarship, and then at 19, got married, dropped out of school, took a minimum wage job, I thought my dream was over. I got a chance down the road at the University of Houston. And I made it as a special needs teacher. I still remember that first year as a special needs teacher. I could tell you what those babies looked like. I had four to, uh, four to six year olds. But at the end of that first year, I was visibly pregnant. And back in the day, that meant that the principal said to me, um, wished me luck and hired someone else for the job. So there I am. I'm at home. I got a baby. I can't have a job. What am I going to do? Here's resilience. I said, I'll go to law school. And the consequence was I practiced law for about 45 minutes mm -hmm. uh, and then went back to my first love, which is teaching. But it let me get into fights. It gave me new tools. And the reason I'm standing here today is because I got back up. I fought back. I know what's broken. I want to be in the fight to fix it in America. Thank That's you, Senator. That's why I'm here. Senator Sanders. Resilience to me means growing up in a rent-controlled apartment in Brooklyn, New York, the son of an immigrant who came to this country without a nickel in his pocket. Professional resilience means to be George running for U.S. Senate in Vermont and getting 1 percent of the vote, running for governor and getting 2 percent of the vote, finally becoming mayor of Burlington, Vermont, with 10 vote margin. What resilience means to me is that throughout my political career, I have taken on virtually every 
powerful special interest in this country. Whether it is Wall Street, whether it is the insurance industry, whether it is the pharmaceutical industry whose corruption and greed is killing people today, whether it is a military industrial complex or a prison industrial complex. And I feel confident that given a lifelong record of taking on powerful special interests, of standing up for the working families of this country, that I will be able to take on the greed and corruption of the corporate elite and create a government and an economy that work for all of us, not just the 1%. Thank you, Senator Sanders. <laughs> Senator Harris. You know, uh, every office I've run for, whether it be district attorney or attorney general, um, I was told each time, it can't be done. They said, nobody like you has done it before. Um, you're, nobody is ready for you. Um, when I ran for DA, I won and became the first black woman elected DA in a state of 40 million people in San Francisco. When I ran for attorney general of California, I was elected because um, I didn't listen. And I was the only um, black elected, woman black elected um, attorney general in the state, in the country. And each time people would say, it's not your time, it's not your turn, it's going to be too difficult, they're not ready for you. And I didn't listen. And a part of it probably comes from the fact that I was raised by a mother who said um, many things that were life lessons for me, including don't you ever let anybody tell you who you are. You tell them who you are. And when I look around the town halls that we do in this race for president of the United States, and I look at the, um, the, the, the meetings that we do in the community meetings, and I see these little girls and boys, um, sometimes even brought by their fathers, and they bring them to me, and I talk to them during these events, and they smile, and they're full of joy, and their fathers tell them, see, don't you ever listen and let anybody ever tell you what you can or cannot be. You have to believe in what can be unburdened by what has been. Senator Harris, thank you very much. Mayor Buttigieg. You know, as a military officer serving under Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and as an elected official in the state of Indiana when Mike Pence was governor, at a certain point, when it came to professional setbacks, I had to wonder whether just acknowledging who I was was going to be the ultimate career-ending professional setback. <clears throat> I came back from the deployment and realized that you only get to live one life, and I was not interested in not knowing what it was like to be in love any longer. So I just came out. I had no idea what kind of professional setback it would be, especially because, inconveniently, it was an election year in my socially conservative community. What happened was that when I trusted voters to judge me based on the job that I did for them, they decided to trust me and re-elected me with 80% of the vote. And what I learned was that trust can be reciprocated and that part of how you can win and deserve to win is to know what's worth more to you than winning. And I think that's what we need in the presidency right now. We have to know what we are about. And this election is not about any of us up here. It is not about this president, even though it's hard to talk of anything else some days. It's about the people who trust us with their lives. A kid wondering if we're actually going to make their schools safe when they've learned active shooter drills before, before they've learned to read. A generation wondering whether we will actually get the job done on climate change. And if we hold to that, then it doesn't matter what happens to each of us professionally. Together, we will win a better era for our country. Mayor Buttigieg, thank you. Okay. Uh, did you remember watching that at all? I honestly, I don't. Um, I, I'm sure I watched it and stuff, but I, I, for some reason, I didn't take notes on it or something. I, I don't know what was going on at that point. Mr. Young. I was an unhappy lawyer for five whole months and I left to start a business. And I'm gonna share with you all one of the secrets to entrepreneurship. 
If you want to start something, tell everyone you know you're going to do it. <laughs> And then you don't have a choice. You put your heart and soul into it. And even though I did that, my company flopped, had its mini rise and maximum fall. I uh, lost investors, hundreds of thousands of dollars, still owed 100,000 in uh, school debt. My parents still told people I was a lawyer. <laughs> I guess it was a little easier. Uh, so I remember lying, uh, lying on my floor, looking up, wondering how it had come to this. Uh, eventually, I picked myself back up. I kept working in small growth companies for another 10 years and eventually had some success. And then after I did have some success, I still remembered how hard it was, how isolating it was, how it feels like your friends uh, no longer want to spend time with you. And so I spent seven years starting and running a nonprofit that helped train young entrepreneurs around the country, including Sean Wen, who's here in the audience tonight, who left... To, who left his gilded Wall Street job to, be, to become a food entrepreneur in San Antonio. Sean, I hope I made the process a little bit easier for you than it was for me. But the goal of my campaign is to make this an economy that allows us to live our human values and aspirations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yang. Senator Booker. So uh, my biggest professional setback is, is embarrassing because a lot of folks know about it. I, with a bunch of tenant leaders in Newark, New Jersey in 2002 took on the political machine and boy did they fight back. I had tires on my car slashed, our campaign offices were broken into, my phones were tapped. Uh, it became a spectacle and we lost that election. And here's a bit of advice to everybody. If you're going to have a spectacular failure, have a documentary team there to capture it because it made for an Oscar-nominated documentary called Street Fight. But then, unfortunately, another setback, it lost in the Oscars to a movie called March of the Dagnab Penguins, for crying out loud. <laughs> the people in my community living in the projects told me, don't give up on the people and the people won't give up on you. Create bigger and bolder coalitions and you're going to win. And you know what? We came back four years later and won the largest lopsided victory in our city's history. But more than that, the lesson was there. We didn't give up. We were taking on America's toughest problems from crime to poverty, and we transformed our city, creating tens of thousands of new jobs, the biggest economic expansion in our city, and as I said before, turned around our school system. There's more work to do, but I haven't given up on the people. I still live in that community. But this is the big lesson. My staff and my friends and my community told me, if you want to go fast, you may have won the mayor's race, but that's not what life is about. There's an old African saying that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. The lesson I learned of resilience is to trust people, because the power of the people is always greater than the people in power. And the test of America right now, it's not a referendum on Donald Trump, it's a referendum on us and who we are and who we're going to be together. We need to use this moment in history to unite in common cause and common purpose, and then there's nothing we can't do together as a nation. Senator Booker, thank you. <laughs> Congressman O'Rourke. Thank you, George. Uh, every, everything that I've learned about resilience, I've learned from my hometown of El Paso, Texas. In the face of this act of, of terror that was directed at our community in large part by the President of the United States that killed 22 people and injured many more. We were not defeated by that, nor were we defined by that. The very thing that drew that killer to us is the very thing that helps us set the example for the rest of this country. We don't see our differences as disqualifying or dangerous. We see them as foundational to our success, to our strength, and to our security, and to our safety. Yesterday, I was visiting with one of those victims. He's the head coach of the Fusion. This is a girls soccer team of 10 and 11-year-old girls. His name is Luis. He was shot in the legs multiple times. He was shot in the side multiple times. He's still healing from his wounds in the hospital, but from his hospital bed, he's still trying to coach the Fusion girls soccer team. Um, Memo, his co-coach, is still fighting for his life uh, right now at Del Sol Hospital. Those two men, Jessica and Marcella, their wives, they exemplify resilience to me. And, and when we end this scourge of gun violence in this country, when we finally confront the racism that exists in America, when we're defined not by our fears, but instead by our aspirations and our ambitions, it will be in large part, I think, thanks to the example that El Paso has set. Congressman, thank, thank you. you. Senator Klobuchar. My challenges and resilience have brought me up here. I grew up with a dad who struggled with alcoholism his whole life. And after his third DWI, 
He had a choice between jail and treatment. He chose treatment with his faith, with his friends, with our family. And in his words, he was pursued by grace. And that made me interested in public service because I feel like everyone should have that same right to be pursued by grace. I then got married. My husband's out there somewhere, hopefully smiling. Um, and our daughter. And our daughter was born. I had this expectation. We we're going to have this perfect, perfect birth. And she was really sick. And she couldn't swallow. And she was in and out of hospitals for a year and a half. But when she was born, they had a rule in place that you got kicked out of the hospital in 24 hours. She was in intensive care, and I was kicked out. And I thought, this could never happen to any other mom again. So I went to the legislature, our state legislator, not an elected official, a mom. And I advocated for one of the first laws in the country guaranteeing new moms and their babies a 48-hour hospital stay. And when they tried to delay the implementation of that law, I brought six pregnant friends to the conference committee, so they outnumbered the lobbyists two to one. Mm -hmm. And when they said, when should it take place, they all raised their hand and said, now. That is what motivated me to go into public service. And when I got to that gridlock of Washington, D.C., I got to work and pass over 100 bills. And I know a lot of my friends here from the left, but remember, I am from the middle of the country. And I believe if we're going to get things done, that we have to have someone leading the ticket with grit. Someone's going to not just change the policies, but change the tone in the country. And someone who believes in America and believes it from their heart because of where they came from, that everyone should have that same opportunity. Senator, thank you. <laughs> Secretary Castro. And thank you, George, to Jorge, to Lindsay, and to David, and to all of y'all for tuning in tonight. Uh, in many ways, I shouldn't be here on this stage. You know, uh, Castro is my mother's name and was my grandmother's name before her. Uh, I grew up in a single-parent household on the west side of San Antonio, going to the public schools. Uh, eventually, my brother Joaquin and I became the first in our family to become professionals. Uh, and when I got home, I took a job at the biggest law firm in town. I was making $100,000 a year in the year 2000. Uh, a few months later, I got elected to the San Antonio City Council. And the City Council at the time was only paying $1,040 a year. So everybody had another job, and my job was at the law firm. Uh, well, a few months after I got elected, uh, the law firm got a client. And the client wanted those of us on the City Council to vote for a land deal. The land deal was that they wanted to build a golf course over our water supply because we relied on an underground aquifer. Uh, I didn't think the Environmental Protection Plan was strong enough, so I wanted to vote against it, and my constituents wanted me to vote against it. But under the ethics rules for lawyers in Texas, because believe it or not, lawyers have ethics rules, uh, you can't just go against the interests of a client. So I was stuck. Um, on the one hand, I wanted to do the right thing. On the other hand, my livelihood, my student loans, my new house payment, my car payment, depended on me shutting up, being conflicted out. So one day, I walked into my law firm, and I quit my job. And then I went and I voted against that land deal on the city council. And, you know, it was the first test that I had. And I think back to that because oftentimes we think of politics, and you think of politics as dirty or corrupting. I wondered before I went in it whether it would change who I was. And I was proud that when that first test came, that I stood up for the people that I was there to represent and not for big special interests. There's nobody that gets tested more in a position of public trust than the President of the United States. This President has failed that test. But I want you to know that if you elect me President, I won't. I won't serve anybody except you and your family. And together, we can create an America that's better than ever. I was probably on my third IPA. <laughs> you mean you weren't completely sober taking notes for the Rob Berger show watching this? I'm very disappointed in you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, in vino veritas, Bob, I wanted to get at the truth. I see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it was uh, it was interesting. I, I stayed after the uh, the the event at the bar there and talk to the two organizers a little bit. It was, it was interesting. And there was, there was a story there. I don't know what the story is. There was some mm -hmm. story about around 2015, the Democrats abroad Korea branch was kind of shuttered, mm. which seems like a strange thing to do in the year before the run up to a major election. But um, these guys are trying to reconstitute it and they're, 
I think they have to, I don't know. I don't know. I, I think you should talk to them sometime and like try to get the story from them. Cause it sounds like an interesting story to some degree. And they're trying to get re kind of recertified and stuff. And I think there are hmm. maybe membership requirements for that. And they have to, you know, elect a board or something and stuff. It's, it's pretty complicated stuff, but, uh, interesting. Hmm. I don't know. I, I think to the degree that there are American expats abroad in Korea, I have to imagine that a lot of them are going to be left wing people. I mean, you know, yeah. traveling abroad, not all of them. I've met a couple of, you know, Republicans over here, but they're in this, they're in the distinct minority, I would say. Right. Although, to be fair, there's a lot of foreigners over here who are not, not politically aware, not politically active, not really paying attention. Don't think it really matters. You know, they're, you know, they're enjoying their adventure in another country. And that's, you know, what's going on in America is not necessarily their priority, which has never been the case mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like when I was in uh, Europe in college, I was talking to somebody and they were like, how does Bush get elected? Nobody, no American I talk to likes him. I'm like, yeah, you'll never <laughs> talk to the ones who like him. <laughs> Probably. You're I talking imagine. to the, re you're talking to the Bush refugees. right Yeah, now. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. These are the ones who got away, which, you know, I, I escaped the last year or so of Bush's reign. So, Oh, my only regret is that I didn't spend a little bit more time back in America during Obama's reign. Yeah, I know, right? Obama's you missed reign. the whole Obama thing. <laughs> I'm certainly not coming back for Trump, so. <laughs> so. It looks like, you know, another year. Yeah, I'm renewing my contract next week, so, I, you know, yeah, I think the boss is happy with me and everything's going well, so he's taking care of the paperwork and stuff for me, so that's cool. So that's good. Get enough, yeah, so I think we're going to probably be working together for the foreseeable future. Mm. So excited about that and stuff. Stuff's going on. Work's going well. So, I mean, cool. it's busy as hell. Mm. But yeah, I think, you know, I think, I think things are going well. Knock on wood. Yeah. There's always some drama. <laughs> so I don't know. Yeah. So what's going on with you, Bob? I saw, I saw, I had, I happened upon YouTube or Ash's YouTube channel recently. Oh yeah, what did you think? Well, I I saw two thirds of your your visit to like Lake Michigan or something. Oh yeah, you saw that? I saw yeah the first two. Yeah, she yeah, just uploaded the third one, so yeah. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. Um, yeah, the kids are cute. I mean, it's it's crazy like how, you know, you always say the kids are getting so big, but it's like really like your daughter looks about the age your son was when I was there last, maybe a little I bit think, younger. Yeah. And that, your son is like. Surprised running around and talking and stuff and having conversations in a coherent way. It's, it's, oh, yeah. it's wild. He's doing math and everything. <laughs> oh my God. Well, he, he may be more advanced than me in that case, <laughs> in that regard. I'm not, I'm decidedly not doing math in my life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I don't remember. I, I remember in university the day I had my last math class, I, uh -huh. I know I threw a house party that night. I don't know if you were <laughs> yeah. there or not, but I, I remember, I, I remember yeah, I, I def I don't remember the party or anything, but I remember it was like an eight thirty in the morning to nine thirty in the morning class that I nearly failed just from missing so many classes because it was so early in the morning and I hate math. <laughs> and on the day when I passed that class and I had my last math class, I thought, this is it, Cha. This is the last time that I will really, really, really have to do math. <laughs> and to a to a great degree, certainly for like advanced math, that was definitely true. So that was fun. Happy memories.
Join the Rob Burgess Show mailing list. Go to tinyletter.com forward slash the Rob Burgess Show and type in your email address. Then respond to the automatic message. Also, please make sure to comment, follow, like, subscribe, share, rate, and review everywhere the podcast is available, including iTunes, YouTube, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play Music, Twitter, Internet Archive, TuneIn, RSS, and now Spotify. The official website for the podcast is www.therobburgessshow.com. You can find out more about me by visiting my website, www.thisburgess.com. If you have something to say, record a voice memo on your smartphone and send it to therobburgessshow at gmail.com. Include voice memo in the subject line of the email. Also, if you want to call or text the show for any reason, the number is 317-674-3547. Until next time.